So welcome everybody to the final session of our People's COVID inquiry. Tonight's session is called The Pandemic Continues. What must happen now? A big question. I'm Tony O'Sullivan and I'm co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public that's organized this. Today's more or less BBC program calculated that there've been 47,000 deaths of residents in care homes, 47,000, one third of all COVID-19 deaths. And there'll be more about that tonight, sadly. Previous witnesses have told us that six out of every 10 deaths have been disabled people. We've heard that black men are four times more likely to die. Women have suffered massively greater social and economic impact under COVID. NHS staff morale is seriously in danger from the traumas of the pandemic and the way the government has disrespected them and disrespected the NHS. Children and adults' mental health has suffered unimaginably and we'll hear more about that tonight also. The pandemic sadly is ongoing and the government continues to reject basic public health measures to suppress the virus. Matt Hancock's latest this week is that the government has avoided financial support for people to isolate or quarantine because the government suspects that many would game the system for their 500 pounds. He has no such scruples when his friends' companies get PPE contracts uh, or when he omitted to mention that he was a shareholder of his sister's company that's winning NHS contracts in Wales. There's more again tonight about the ongoing pandemic and government governance. The, min the Prime Minister's claim that he truly did everything to minimise the impact of COVID and to keep the, the people safe, it's just not defensible. And there's one Dominic Cummings, who is a gamekeeper turned poacher, appears to back our evidence of governance issues and incompetence. So let us see what our witnesses tonight offer as we, as we learn more on what must happen now to save lives. That was the purpose of our inquiry. Thank you to all the witnesses that have given their time and are appearing tonight. A couple of quick announcements. Tonight's session will last longer than usual because we've got uh, more witnesses than usual. This is our final session and there's a great deal to fit in. So please stay with us if you can. We're due to finish at 9.30. Live captioning is available. And uh, as usual, if you wish to do this, you can click on the CC caption at the bottom of your screen. Um, and there's also the accessibility, accessibility guide, which I'm going to put in the chat room shortly. There'll be links posted in the chat throughout the session just to help you uh, um, find useful links for following the COVID inquiry, our crowdfunder asking you to support us, registration links for the July the 7th meeting, a newly announced meeting, which we'll, we'll come to later, but we're, where we're going to present important urgent findings from the inquiry. And also uh, messages about newsletter signups to keep our interest public, to keep in touch. I just want to say the video is being recorded and it will be available to watch as are all the sessions and they're available on the People's COVID Inquiry website. So our panel chair tonight is, as usual, Michael Mansfield, QC, internationally renowned human rights lawyer, and he's currently involved in the Grenfell Inquiry. As you will all know, he's represented many families, including the Stephen Lawrence family, Hillsborough families, and many others. So thank you, Michael. Professor Nina Modi is professor of neonatal medicine Imperial College London, and she's president of the UK Medical Women's Federation. Dr. Talula Oni is urban epidemiologist and public health physician at the MRC Epidemiology Unit, University of Cambridge. And Jackie Davis is an NHS consultant radiologist and an author and a member of the BMA Council. Um, and she's appearing as are all the panel as um, in the personal capacity. And finally, Lorna Hackett, who's been uh, wonderful for us throughout the inquiry, is barrister at Hackett and Dabs and is acting as counsel to the inquiry. So 
It is my honour to hand over in this last session to Michael Mansfield to start tonight's proceedings. Thank you, Michael. Good evening. Well, as you've heard, it's the last session and it's hard to believe that we've been going for four months. And the ninth session every two weeks. And so before actually embarking upon tonight's final hearing, there are a couple of things I want to say. The first is really to thank the campaign, Keep Our National Health Service Public. Uh, because without their efforts in the first place, to get this off the ground, a citizen's inquiry, it's not the first of its kind, but it's the only inquiry that has been established to deal with the predicament we're all in. In other words, fulfilling an obligation, a legal and moral obligation, that this government has failed to, to successfully establish at this moment. And uh, uh, there will be more about it as to whether, in fact, anything like this is really going to take off even next year, but less about that. But because it's been such a, an incredible enterprise, enormous amount of effort, I want, first of all, just to place on record at the beginning rather than the end, um, our thanks, my thanks to the campaign for all the work they've done behind the scenes. I'm not going to name everybody or anybody. It would be invidious because it's been an enormous uh, effort as you may imagine, to assemble the witnesses, collate the evidence, produce the, in a sense, the volumes of material that we rely upon before each hearing. And so enormous thanks are owed to them uh, by the people who essentially are the, the base of this whole enterprise. And secondly, I want to thank the three co-panelists with me who are all experts in their own right, who've contributed a great deal in terms of discussion and questions. And of course, as has been hinted already, our task is not finished by any stage. The hearings have, but as Tony just mentioned, in a few weeks time, we'll have another, in a sense a hearing, but it's, a, it's really a press conference in which we will indicate those manifestly obvious and rather urgent requirements of government now to deal with the situation that we're facing now. Not next year, not in five years after that, but immediately. But in addition to that, huge task, but we're going to do it this year, long before they've even got off the ground, is to produce a report which incorporates the urgent matters, but actually fulfills our duty to the evidence to ensure that it's all there in a readable form, accessible form to the public. And they're really at the end of this list that I want to thank the public because every week, I can't tell whether it's always the same people, have watched and given us support and sent in questions and have participated. And it really is the people's inquiry. Now tonight it's just slightly different. It's longer. There are more witnesses. Normally we try and get through four in a couple of hours. That's, that's a, a very tight schedule, but tonight we have seven. But there are two features tonight that are different and I just want to mention them. One is that there'll be a statement being read, which is we haven't done that before. We've had a lot of statements sent in. There hasn't been time to read them, but this one tonight is very pertinent to current issues that uh, we are all aware of. And that'll come later today. And additionally, at the end of all the witnesses, um, we're calling a, an expert, a lawyer. Now this sometimes happens in inquiries that where there are specialist areas, you call specialist lawyers to deal with it. And the reason we're doing that is we're covering an area that no one else is really debating. You'll have heard a lot about the medical safeguards or non-safeguards, the provision, the non-provision. But what you haven't heard about is accountability and responsibility. And there are various headings which the last witness will deal with, which may be an eye opener to some people in terms of why the government is, we say, hiding from the truth. Having said that, may I also thank counsel to the inquiry, to whom I'm going to hand over right now. That's Lorna Hackett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mansfield. Uh, the first witness this evening is Dr. Deepti Gurdasani. 
Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, statement, which I understand was written relatively recently. Um, I, I understand that uh, you confirm that the opinions you've expressed represent your true and complete professional opinions on the matters to which they refer. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, Dr. Deepti Gudasani, could you um, tell the panel what your occupation is, please? Um, I'm a scientist. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in machine learning at Queen Mary University of London. My research focuses on understanding the impact of different interventions in COVID on uh, pandemic growth and understanding how to synthesize evidence um, into policy. Well, I'm going to ask you a really annoyingly broad question now, so I apologize in advance. But can you outline your views on the government's strategy in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect on morbidity and mortality overall? Um, I mean, I think it's been a response, it's, it's been a strategy of, I would say negligent manslaughter, but I think that's far too generous because it's not negligent. It's uh, essentially a policy where they have been fully informed on the risks to public health, the risk of mass death, the risk of suffering, but have gone ahead with this anyway, because these risks and the impact on people were considered acceptable. The government policy from the beginning has focused on, well, there's been a sort of herd immunity narrative or living with the virus acceptable deaths uh, or inevitable deaths narrative inherent in it, which has suggested that it's a strategy where we sort of tolerate a level of um, the pandemic or infection in our society, fully knowing that you know it'll impact people unequally, and of course will lead to hundreds and thousands of deaths, which it has. We know that over 150,000 people now have died of COVID. We know that we have a million people now living with long COVID, which is long-term impacts of an infection that we don't understand. We don't know how long this will last in these people, what the impacts are going to be on them in the long-term and unforgivably 30,000 of those are children. Um, and about 200,000 of those people have had symptoms, uh, debilitating symptoms for over a year now. Um, and you know, uh, we've been told that this was inevitable and it was something that we just have to live with and accept. Of course, we know that's not the case because in many, many countries, countries that are more densely populated, that are more connected than us, um, that have managed to avoid this massive impact on their society. So I would say the, the values that have been inherent in our government's response has been a lack of value for life, lack of compassion and a lack of um, consideration for people suffering. Thank you. Um, you talk in your witness statement about um, a preference that this government has had for tech in favour of uh, traditional public health measures. Can you explain what you mean by that and, uh, and how it's actually affected us as a population? So our government strategy from the beginning has been grounded in exceptionalism. We rejected public health measures that other countries were taking that were ahead of us in the pandemic. Uh, you know, we were sort of lucky because this pandemic hit us in March after it hit Italy and much of Southeast Asia, who actually managed to contain it very early on without any lockdowns. Um, and they were using public health measures like test, trace, isolate systems, which we abandoned, I think on the March 12th, mm -hmm. uh, saying that these systems were only appropriate for low and middle income countries. We abandoned quarantine, suggesting this was not going to work. Um, and we did try and take our way out of this. So we were repeatedly told, I think sometime in April that there were millions of antibody tests that were ordered that never saw the light on, of day, never had any impact on the pandemic. We were told that our ventilator capacity would be fixed by asking Dyson who had no experience with ventilators to manufacture ventilators. We had shortages of PPE which led to the deaths of many healthcare workers. Um, and you know, we asked companies with absolutely no experience in this to provide this when they were companies within the UK, local companies who came forward wanting to help. Um, we, uh, you know, put our entire test trace isolate system in the hands of a private service that still hasn't delivered. We still don't have a test trace isolate system that works despite having local authorities who could have done this really well. And it's very clear that the NHS test trace isolate system consistently outperformed our private one. You know, more recently we were told about Operation Moonshot bringing an end to this last December, not only did Operation Moonshot not help us exit the pandemic, it's really questionable whether there's been any output out of this that has been useful at all. Last week, we found out that 
the tests that have been used for Operation Moonshot have been recalled by the FDA, citing serious concerns and uh, serious harm and risk to life and risk of spread of infection. Um, I mean, there's so many examples of this, but not only have we relied on technology, we relied on technology without any consultation with experts in this field. You know, people who were involved in screening were not involved in, uh, you know, buying or deploying rapid tests, and they uh, raised concerns very early on, but nobody was listening. And there was no engagement with the NHS and healthcare systems or local authorities. All of this has been done out with our existing public health systems and out with expert advice. Uh, in the hope that somehow technology is going to be the answer to all of this. Um, while, you know, 16 months down the line, we still don't have a focus on sorting out aerosol transmission. We still don't have appropriate ventilation schools and workplaces. We still don't have mask wearing in environments that we need it. And we still don't have a functioning test race isolate system. Our government now has the public, I think, convinced that lockdowns are the only way to control infection where they're actually a failure of pandemic response because if you control infection well, you don't need lockdowns, but our government never managed to do that because there was a huge amount of focus on technology. I mean, we had companies like Palantir and faculty who were involved and I still don't know exactly what they were involved in, but you know, they're companies that work on AI and data analytics. Um, and yes, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else to say except that it's been really, really poorly thought out. Mm. So you talk about, um the sort of public health measures that other countries took and that we were fortunate that it only came to us in March. Is it now in June 2021 too late to return to classic public health measures? No, it's never too late to return to classic public health measures. I mean, people repeatedly tell me that, oh, we can't do this now because the public are really tired. Actually, it's not the public that are really tired. The government has consistently talked about Freedom Day and people won't want to accept uh, lockdowns or restrictions when actually the public has been way ahead of our government right from the beginning. In March, the public wanted an earlier lockdown. Uh, even right now, there's more support. It was, you know, a majority of support for postponing so-called Freedom Day. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's the blame on the public sort of subverts from the fact that it's always the government uh, that has been resistant to putting those measures in place. I mean, if you look at the briefings, the key briefings you've had at points in time where decisions have been made, if you look at the last briefing, what was the entire briefing about? It was about postponing Freedom Day by four weeks. There was no discussion of what systems we're going to put in place to make sure we don't, we're not there in the next four weeks. The government has put out this narrative that vaccinations are going to be our way out of this without putting in any measures to actually protect our vaccines. Uh, and where we are now is entirely, was entirely predictable. I mean, scientists and SAGE have been warning about this from February, again in May, and again, very recently in June, that we would need another lockdown or another sort of set of restrictions unless government put in place those systems. But lockdowns were never used to put in place those basic systems to ensure that we didn't need them again, yet they were supposedly you know, irreversible. So it's never late with good public messaging, with good support for people, I think that's key because lockdowns impact people. Of course they do, restrictions impact people, but I think we need to recognize the only people way to reduce impact on people is to get on top of the pandemic and reduce the need for those sort of restrictions and lockdowns. Mm -hmm. And that means that we need to support people during those periods with adequate funding, with adequate practical support. Um, and with that, I do believe that people will follow, but the problem here is not people. They've consistently followed the rules. It's just that the rules have been wrong. Mm -hmm. So we um, thank you for, for that. That's um, that's interesting. It's um, there, I just want to take you back to um, somebody who was giving evidence in our last inquiry session, um, Professor of Economics and Public Policy, Jonathan Pauls, and he talked about the myth. Uh, perpetuated by government uh, that lives have to be sacrificed in order to save the economy. Now that's key here, isn't it, when we're talking about the delay of Freedom Day. Uh, what effect did this myth, uh, if you think it's a myth, have specifically in relation to the government's border policy, for example? 
Yes. So again, the myth was we can't put in comprehensive restrictions at borders because, you know, we are a highly connected country and a lot of our economy depends on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to people who say that, and the media completely repeats this as well, um, it's, it's false economy. I mean, just look at what's happened now. Our scientific advisory group, SAGE, told government very clearly in January, and it's written and documented, that unless they implemented a comprehensive quarantine system, by which I mean mandatory quarantine for people coming from all countries, uh, you know, for uh, a period of time, we would import new variants. And that's what happened. And now we've imported a variant that's highly transmissible, that's more severe, that's been linked to a current wave that we know has caused devastation in other parts of the world, and that's able to escape vaccines to a greater extent than, than before. And that has threatened our vaccine strategy. So although vaccines are still reasonably effective, they're still less effective than before, and potentially the duration of immunity is less than before. And all of this is going to have big impacts on our pandemic response. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's the potential that even tomorrow we could import a new variant from a different part of the world that could almost completely escape vaccines. And um, there is this false economy, I feel, of investing huge amounts of money in making vaccines, making updated vaccines to deal with new variants, and then doing absolutely nothing to preserve them and keeping our borders open or, you know, sort of um, not fully controlled um, and not preventing transmission that would prevent the sort of virus adaptation that leads to escape from those vaccines. So we've chosen a very risky strategy by putting all our eggs in the vaccine basket, which we didn't need to do. We could have followed a strategy like Australia, New Zealand, where we combined vaccines with elimination. We didn't do that. But at the same time, we've done nothing to actually protect the only strategy that we have. And the whole border policy is another example of false economy. Not only is it an example of false economy, it's also deeply unethical because our, uh, you know, our lack of pandemic control spawned the so-called Kent variant, which was then exported to many, many other countries as people travel to those countries because mm -hmm. we didn't have those border protections in place and led to a devastating third wave across Europe mm -hmm. and across parts of the US and many other parts of the world. And we're continuing to do this now with the Delta variant with absolutely no concern for mm -hmm. other countries who have far less access to vaccines than we do. And we've done very little to actually make that access more equitable. So how has vaccine nationalism impacted on an international approach? So vaccine nationalism is the crux of our government strategy. It's how they've managed to, I think, escape scrutiny and maintain support in the face of what is a disastrous pandemic response. Um, and the narrative has been that, you know, we've developed these vaccines and we've, you know, had a really, really successful rollout of vaccines. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we've we've been quite opposed to sort of sharing of vaccines. And very recently, we've signed up with the G7 to, you know, promote a level of sharing of vaccines. I think many people don't realize that the UK actually has um, uh, procured 400 million vaccines. So it's ordered 400 million vaccines, which is, uh, you know, about eight doses for our population. And you know, we have a lot to spare. It's not a small amount. Uh, but even beyond that, I mean, uh, in terms of many countries don't just need vaccines to be shared. They would like resources to sort of up their manufacturing capacity. They would like patents to be waived or technology transfer agreements to be put in place so that those vaccines can be manufactured domestically. Those are things that we've consistently opposed. In fact, we've reduced our foreign aid budget during the same time as this is ongoing with, with countries that, you know, have been some of the worst affected having um, cuts in aid. And at the same time, while there's been devastation in other countries like in India during their crisis in March, we were very happy to uh, sort of uh, take about 10 million vaccines from India um, you know, into the UK to vaccinate our own population. Mm -hmm. So I think the government have cer has certainly won the support of the public on this strategy, but you know, the pandemic isn't over mm -hmm. until you know, it's over everywhere. And I think vaccine nationalism and just nationalism per se has played a huge role in our government's response. And, you know, it's very, it's very interesting how the media never actually discusses the response in other countries. And people aren't aware that life could be so different had we adopted an elimination strategy last year or even learned much later and adopted it uh, more recently. Mm. Um, can commercial vaccine patents be changed to allow access to affordable vaccines that, you know, all over the world? 
So I'm definitely not <laughs> a patent expert. So I don't know if I can, um, I, I can like give you a very sort of reason <clears throat> on that. I mean, can they be waived from a sort of legal point of view or can they be waived from well, so it, it's to provide vaccines all over the world. I mean, you, yeah. you've touched on it's the reason why. Oh, I yeah, you touched on. I mean, uh, this certainly can be waived. I mean, I, I you know, I, I understand a lot of discussions around this are far more complex than my understanding of it, but they certainly can be waived. I mean, we've seen this in, well, we, we've seen this in, in previous contexts. I mean, not just with vaccines, with drugs. So, for example, you know, with the HIV epidemic very early on, the drugs were very, very expensive and not available to most countries that were having the epidemic at that point in time. For example, you know, India and South Africa. And the drugs were then made generic. Mm. And they were manufactured at a fraction of the cost, which had a huge impact on the HIV epidemic in um in, in India and in South Africa and, and all other countries where the generic drugs were then used very, very widely in populations they wouldn't have had access to. And we have a long history of this in India where generic manufacturing is, is quite developed. Uh, and it can be done, of course, if, if those patents are waived. So there, there is certainly a lot of manufacturing capacity in those countries that is, is not being used at this point in time simply because, uh, you know, it, it just can't be used in this regard because those things have been blocked. Having said that, I'm sure there are far more complex issues around this that I'm not aware of at all. Uh, this not being my area of expertise. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Well, I'm going to ask you something that definitely is in your area of expertise then. And it's my last question. And that is, what should happen next? Uh, what should happen next? <laughs> so my view is that um, if we are to learn lessons from what's happened in the last 16 months, I think the biggest lesson that we need to learn is we cannot live with this. Mm -hmm. I think the question of living with the virus and acceptable deaths, because when you're saying deaths are acceptable, I think you have to ask yourself, why are they acceptable? How many deaths are acceptable? And who are they acceptable in? And who will they happen in? And the fact is, a lot of, I think our government doesn't care about acceptable deaths because they're in vulnerable individuals, they're in ethnic minority groups, they're in key workers, frontline workers, um, they're in you know, pe people who live in deprived areas and, and people who've been left behind. They're in the disabled, they're in the homeless. Um, and um, you know, frankly, as a society, we can't accept that. And we don't have to accept that. There are the models out there that show us that we don't and every single death is preventable. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's coming at this huge economic cost. It's very, very clear that countries that valued life, that treated deaths as preventable are the same countries that have done best economically. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who think that our pandemic strategy has been a success should look at the number of deaths and number of people suffering with long COVID, but also the impact on our economy, on the fact that we've been in restrictions for, well, 16 months, three lockdowns, uh, four months of children being out of education. How is this even remotely a success? So if I would say we need elimination along with vaccine rollout and that is completely achievable. What we need to do to achieve that is essentially, first of all, lay down a long-term plan to the public. It can't be changed restrictions of four weeks, lockdown, These, this ad hoc chaotic communication clear public messaging. What we need is to fix our broken test trace isolate system, put it in the hands of local authorities who know how to do this, who know their communities really, really well and can work with them, support people with isolation. There's absolutely no point putting in billions into tests if only one in five people with symptoms are coming forward for testing because they don't have any, they don't have adequate support with isolation. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have a comprehensive quarantine, managed quarantine and supported quarantine strategy at borders to prevent new variants coming in that could really threaten our pandemic response and our vaccine effectiveness. And we need to bring transmission right down. And a big part of that is going to be mitigations in schools and workplaces. We need to invest in infrastructure that and, and ventilation in places for the longer term, not just now. This is going to have long-term benefits for health even post-pandemic, if we get to post-pandemic. But you know, we need to focus on containing aerosol transmission. We need, um, uh, you know, we need to supplement ventilation in schools, in buildings, in workplaces. We need masks for children in schools. Uh, and uh, we need, once we bring transmission down to keep transmission down. So we need to have rapid surveillance 
uh, whenever there are little outbreaks here and there and prevent them spreading into the community. The problem with allowing high levels of transmission with vaccination is that it's really, really dangerous. There's very good research that shows that that's the exact situation in which escape uh, uh, adaptation towards escape happens and escape uh, variants are much more likely to become frequent in the population. And that is exactly the position we are in right now. Um, so I think we need a multi-pronged approach. We need to move away from the vaccine only approach and make sure we protect our vaccine resources, protect our population, support our population through this and provide very clear direction messaging through this process. And I think there also needs to be a clear acknowledgement of mistakes made Mm -hmm. uh, and justice for those who've been affected. Dr. Deepti Gurdasani, I'm sorry, I haven't got any other questions that I can ask you. I'm sure we could sit here for a long time, um, but I'm going to hand you back to Mr. Michael Mansfield, QC, the chair of the panel. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I, 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 a lot of what I, I wanted to ask has been asked in the last question, but I just want to pursue a little bit of that. Namely, we, we are in about two weeks time, three weeks time, as you may have heard, we're hoping to produce what I'm calling manifestly obvious recommendations and conclusions, rather than waiting for our full report. Amongst those, and we've been trying to address it as we go along with witnesses, is what the public would like to know and are anxious to know is, so how are we going to manage the the preservation of the vaccine, as well as the elimination of transmission, when we've got, a, we've got a pandemic where the likelihood of another variant appearing could be tomorrow. So even, you know, and if the, if the virus is anywhere, it's everywhere, that proposition. So I think what the public want to know is, well, what, what kind of, I hate to use the word normality, but what kind of everyday life do you envisage is possible, which combines those two things, the vaccine on the one hand and keeping transmission down on the other hand, what kind of, what, is, what will it look like? Look I'm trying to be practical. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yes. Um, right. So what it will look like getting there and what it'll look like after we get there. I think those are the two phases. So getting there from here, so we are having a reasonably high level of cases per day. So essentially to get there, we, we, will, we will need to go into sadly restrictions at this point of time because we have no other way to bring those cases down because we don't have those basic systems in place. So that means going into some sort of restrictions probably for I would say four to six weeks from this level because that's how much time it will take to get those numbers to zero or near zero. And during that period, really put in place very good, uh, essentially fixing the test race isolate system by putting in the hands of local authorities, increasing support for isolation and putting quarantines in place at borders because um, virus adaptation will happen, it's inevitable. It's only, well, it's inevitable if the virus replicates. The only way to stop it is to stop the virus transmitting and can, can, can i just again. interrupt you a second yeah. i'm sorry to it's only because of pressure of time yeah I, I i i sound like a judge i hear what you say but uh the thing at the end of the day is are you saying to members of the public well the restrictions that are going to be necessary once the transmission's down yeah. Yeah. are going to include wearing a, a mask in schools and we've heard about the fuss on that front and in other teaching you know facilities we're going to have to maintain you know the the distance between us we're going to have to maintain levels of social uh, no. interaction and so, on. so that that's no. what i'm trying to get no. at so that's that's the benefit of an elimination strategy elimination is not eradication but elimination means that you don't have cases in the community anymore it's a strategy that's in australia new zealand iceland uh, South Korea, you know, Southeast Asia, many parts of the world. And then you don't need those things because you don't have cases in the community. Uh, you know, you don't need masks, you don't need social distancing. You can, you know, go to your tennis tournaments, your football matches and things like that because there's no risk uh, at most, on most days. Once in a while, there is a variant that's going to come in and you're going to have an outbreak. What you need to do is you need to aggressively contain it before it gets into the community. So you might need localized lockdowns, which might last for a week or so. Like, Targeted, yeah, yeah, okay. But, but for the most time, you'll be leading a normal life. The thing that won't be normal is the fact that whenever you leave the country and come back or somebody comes to visit you, they will have to quarantine 
in a hotel for 14 days. And how that gets to normal is essentially through two processes. You need to build a, a regionally or globally coordinated strategy of uh, elimination. Like for example, New Zealand and Australia have travel corridors now because both of them have eliminated. And similarly, there are they have been travel corridors between China, Taiwan and other countries. So this has to be done, built out in that way. And vaccines will help because as more and more populations get vaccinated. So that's why global vaccine sharing and equity is really, really important, but it's not the only way to achieve control and elimination. And there is a lot of uncertainty about going a vaccine only strategy and elimination allows us to control that uncertainty and make sure that we return to normal in a very short period of time, whereas it will take much, much longer with vaccines with, and, and whether it's possible or not, with this level of virus adaptation, if we allow the transmission to continue is also questionable. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm just gonna ask if any other panel member has a question. Um, no, we don't, okay. Well, may I thank you very much. You've been extremely clear and you packed a lot in to a very short time. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now ask uh, Lorna Hackett if she would call the next witness, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mansfield. Uh, the next witness is Kevin Courtney. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your Hello. witness statement. Um, there's a, a lot of material here that I've got, um, and I, I want to assure anybody watching that this, all of this material is going to be available on the Keep Our NHS Public and People's COVID Inquiry website um, and that they can download it at their leisure. Sadly, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in it um, in the short period of time that we've got. Uh, but can I just start with um, your witness statement, which is dated the 11th of June 2021, uh, which you have signed with your name and that you confirm that the opinions that you've expressed represent your true and complete professional opinions on the matters to which they refer. I confirm yeah. that. Thank you. Could you uh, give the panel um, your occupation, please? Yes, uh, I was formerly a physics teacher a long while ago. I'm now the Joint General Secretary of the National Education Union, which is the biggest education union. We organise teachers, head teachers and support staff in schools in England and Wales. And as I understand it, that was two, we, is that a form? Is that an amalgamation of two unions previously? Is that correct? Yes, a, a fairly recent amalgamation in two thousand and seventeen of the National Union of Teachers. Uh, I was general secretary of the National Union of Teachers just prior to amalgamation, and the Association of Teachers and Lecturers. Uh, Mary Bowstead was the general secretary of the ATL. We are now both joint general secretaries of the the National Education Union. Thank you. Um, so broadly, um, again, really annoying broad questions this evening. Um, what has the last 16 months been like for those working in education and what kind of support have you offered uh, your members? Um, can I, I, I think the last 16 months has been a, a record of failure by our government because not only have we had the highest death rate per 100,000 in Europe and the most disruption of our economy, but we've also had the most disruption of education, the longest periods of closure or near closure of education. It's important to say near closure because schools have been open throughout for key worker and vulnerable children and teachers and support staff have been in supporting uh, those children. But schools uh, closed for, uh, you know, largely closed for much the longest period. And I think that is a record of failure by this government. And the government has not listened and not engaged when we've wanted to talk about things that would make things better. And we believe sincerely that if they had engaged with the sorts of things that we'd said, that there would have been less disruption of education, mm -hmm. less, less time when children were trying to learn at home and fewer deaths. So the union has been seeking to support its members and the children in schools throughout. We called for a closure of schools, largely for a closure of schools in March before the government took the step. We wish they had done that because we now all realize that, and I think everyone now realizes that if the government had gone to lockdown sooner, the peak would have been much lower we would have got out of the restrictions the other side much sooner. And then if they'd set test track trace up, we, could, we might have stayed out of it. We did that in March. 
In May, we called for five tests for school reopening. They were largely focused on keeping restrictions in place. I think this very much fits with your previous witness, keeping restrictions in place till cases fall to a level where test, track, trace and isolate can then work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the government, we had a bit of engagement with Gavin Williamson about that, but they, they really didn't take it seriously. We then supported the opening of schools in September. We produced a checklist for members about how to ensure safety as much as you can in those circumstances. We supported the opening, but then we were so badly let down in September when schools opened, when all the children went back and when there was a need for mass numbers of tests and they just were not available in September. And that led to the, the well, that was the start we think of the problems throughout the autumn term. We called for the government to um, and we now know that Sage was saying this to them as well. We called for a circuit break around the half term holiday. We know that cases fall in schools when schools are closed, I mean, quite, quite obviously. And we could see already from September to October that case numbers in secondary school children, um, uh, most definitely, to some extent in primary school children, were going up faster than the rest of society. We were therefore saying, have a circuit break, uh, close the schools for a period, for a fortnight. I have one of the weeks as online learning, but close the schools for a fortnight so that cases get down to a proper level where you, then your test track trace can, uh, can work. We know that SAGE were calling for that. The government ignored it. We were calling for rotor operation in secondary schools where children would be taught every lesson, but one week they'd be taught in school and one week at home. The government didn't do that. SAGE said that that would have the same effect on suppressing the virus as closing the whole of hospitality. In November, we called for schools to be in the lockdown, that, that lockdown they had in November, which had some effect, but you can see looking back on all the data, a far lower effect than if they'd also put the schools in that with online learning obviously going on. And we think that has led then to the problem in December that the spread of the Kent variant and then to the, the crisis at the start of January. And we look back on that and look back on the union's role with some uh, pride perhaps, but with some fear about what would have happened if we weren't in the right place at the right time, because the Prime Minister on the 3rd of January said that schools were safe and that all schools would open the next day. We had a meeting that day of 40,000 of our members online on Zoom. We know that 400,000 people watched at least some of that meeting uh, in the Facebook expressions of it. And from that meeting, thousands of our members sent letters to their head teacher saying that they thought it was unsafe to open schools, citing section 44 as a bit of protection on that. And the prime minister changed his mind overnight. And on, Sun on Monday the 4th, told the population of the country that schools were vectors of transmission. Now, I don't know how much our action was influential in him making that vault fast, but we know that some schools did open on that Monday and that the virus spread because of that. And some people will have died because of the virus spread. And it, it, chances are it would not have been our members and it wouldn't have been the children. It would have been the grandparents or the parents of the children. So we believe that we've been trying our best in difficult circumstances. We've been trying to say to the government now, don't stop mask wearing. Yes, it is a pain. Nobody wants to wear masks. But actually, our members have been telling us there have not been disciplinary problems around secondary children wearing masks in class. And SAGE said that the introduction of mass testing and mask wearing, they thought, would reduce transmission in schools by a third. Unfortunately, Gavin Williamson would not listen, uh, removed the prescription for masks on May the 17th. And we're now, uh, obviously it's not the only thing removing mask wearing, but we think it hasn't helped. Yeah. So uh, I wanna go slightly back uh, because that, that was a, a very concise uh, description of what's happened over, over the last sort of 12 to 15 months. Um, can we talk a little bit about the mutant algorithm fiasco? So I think that's important. It, 
It, it really is because, I mean, my, my remarks previously were about the safety questions, yeah. but there is so much more to talk about, yeah. about the way the government failed to support education and is still failing to support the education of young people. Mm -hmm. So one of them was the mutant algorithm last summer. There is lots more about the failure to deliver laptops and broadband to children who need them. There are the concerns about the exams. This summer, there's the failure to implement Kevin Collins's plan. And I don't know whether you might come on to any of those, but the mutant algorithm. This, so we, the government said in March when they decided to lock down and close schools that they wouldn't have exams in the summer. But they tried to replicate the exams in every way they could. And there was a problem with that. You see, every year for GCSEs and A-levels in England, we don't give children grades based on an objective assessment of uh, against a standard uh, called criterion referenced in, in the techniques. Unlike, for example, the driving test, you pass the driving test because you reach a standard. But we don't allocate grades for GCSEs or A-levels in that way in this country. We allocate them by comparison with your peers, with other children. And th that's... That's not the right way to, uh, we don't support that actually from the union as the right way of allocating the results. It leads to all sorts of uh, oddities. For example, a third of children every year by a rule fail their GCSE English exam. A third of children are given a grade regarded as failure, but we, that's the way they do it by this comparison. Uh, so you have a norm reference system, the, techni the technical experts call it. And Gavin Williamson, the DfE and Ofqual were determined to have the same number of grades in each one of those grade boundaries as the year before. And the job of the algorithm was to take the teacher's professional assessment of the child of what they might achieve and to massage those into that, uh, that, that norm referenced curve. And that then led to huge problems. Uh, one of the problems was they had to make an exception for small schools because in any small, you have to look at these things in a bit of a statistical way. They made an exception for small schools. Small schools turn out to be independent schools. So the independent schools all got the grades that their teachers allocated to them and they were high grades, good grades. And that meant that, teacher, that children in other schools then got lower grades. So we had examples of members who had made a fair assessment in their view of a child as achieving a, the equivalent of a level C downgraded to a level U. And that's what that algorithm produced. And that was extraordinarily upsetting to the young people as well as to their teachers. And so the real reason the government did that is that they were terribly frightened of something they call grade inflation. That if a teacher looked at their class and allocated and said, right, who do I think in this class is going to get a, a, an A, an A star? Now they call them a, a, nine, a, a grade nine. Who do I think would get a grade nine or an A star? And they would look around the class. They'd think, uh, they'd not look around the class, they'd think hard about the children, look at their work. And they'd say, these five children are showing me work that, that could get an A star. And so they would allocate them all an A star. Now, in the, in the reality of an exam, some child in that group would get, an would get an exam question they hadn't prepared for, or they would have an off day because, uh, because something terrible had happened in their family because they were ill. And, they would ha and, and so some children then don't get the grade that the teacher thinks they could get on their best day. So the teacher would have allocated all the children the grades they'd get on their best day. They've got no way of knowing which of those five wouldn't get them. So they have to give them that uh, that uh, the, the, a bit of benefit of the doubt, if you like, and that would have led to grade inflation. The government really didn't want that. So they did the algorithm with all the bad consequences. And then they still had, they had to go back to teacher assessment after that. But what a farce and the stress on the young people in that situation, just because they wanted to maintain that uh, norm reference system is simply inexcusable. So uh, moving, in fact, similar question, um, slightly differently phrased. Um, we've heard a bit about this from previous sessions, but can you describe the kind of mental health issues, um, the physical health issues from, for example, long COVID? What, what's really affected your members? What's affected the students? Yeah, uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, some of our members have been... Uh, 
quite reasonably, I think, thinking, uh, so I'll just say a little bit about our members who go on to the children, which is the way the union deals with these things. Yeah. Uh, our, our members in school, are, they ask us questions about the fact that they're in a classroom, certainly before mask wearing was introduced, where there is no effective social distancing, uh, where children aren't wearing masks and where there often, is, often isn't good ventilation. Mm -hmm. So certainly if you're a teacher or a member of support staff with a degree of medical vulnerability, people were feeling very vulnerable in those situations. Now we were working to say that we thought vulnerable people should be at home, but we didn't always achieve that. And those people were feeling very vulnerable. But thinking about the children, the children who were at home for so long and this is also not the same for all children. I think if you're in a, a fairly well-off family uh, where there's quite a lot of room at home, where you probably have your own individual bedroom, maybe you have a garden, you've got a laptop of your own, that is a very different experience to if you're in crowded housing, in some cases where there isn't even a bedroom for you and you sleep in the in the room that's the, the also the living room and where we where we know and we put in the evidence to you that there was far far lower attendance in the schools with more children on free school meals mm -hmm. far higher attendance in schools with less children on free school meals now that is clearly because free school meals children their parents can't are, are not working from home they're going to work where they're more likely to encounter the virus. They are in more dense housing. They are in housing where, which is multi-generational and therefore they're exposed or children in their school, in their class are exposed more often to the virus. And then you get, as well as the general school closure, you're also asked to stay at home because you're a close contact. So there, there were children in the autumn term, even when schools were supposedly open that missed six weeks of education, three periods of two week self-isolation. And if you're at home without that space, then it's much more difficult. And we are finding, our members are finding that there are all sorts of issues with children now that schools are open, of them finding difficulty adjusting to being back in school. There are emotional questions that have been raised that we need time to work through with children so there are that we see all those sorts of difficulties but i just want to say that our members uh in a, in a literal sense looked inside children's homes during this period because when you were doing the zoom class or a class on teams you were on screen the children were on screen and people were our members were seeing the children who were sharing a laptop who have that they see a child trying to do some work and there's another child there and there's another child there. So they see the impact, the differential impact that social class and inequality has. And it's really important that we all see that as a fundamental issue that has to be addressed. There are massively discriminatory impacts of the school closures, the school disruption, and government has to work with us to put those things right about COVID but then about the inequality that existed pre-COVID that, that was shown during COVID. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great that you brought, brought me on to that now, because I'm going to ask you a little bit firstly about school funding and investment over the last 10, 11 years, and then uh, on the effect that COVID has had on schools financially. And, and then we'll talk a bit about the Kevin Collins um, aspect. But can we start with what is happening to school funding and investment um, generally? Uh, and I know there's a huge amount of material uh, contained within your witness statement. So, uh, and what effect has COVID had on, on schools? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That's, that's typical of a teacher to send, to send too much stuff in. We should have, anyway, uh, we have been, work, the NEU has been working on the question of school funding uh, for a significant period of time. After the banking crash, there was a degree of protection of school budgets from 2010 to 2015 when the government was cutting everything else but that protection did not apply to sixth form colleges or to early years setting so they were cut during that period and then schools began being cut uh, from the period of 2015 when the coalition ended and the conservatives were in power alone and schools have since then been cut uh, were cut dramatically 
there is there just before the pandemic, uh, in the run up to the 2019 general election, uh, obviously as part of a move around that, the government had promised uh, several billions of pounds per year. And there was a move to replace some of those cuts that had been made, but in practically no schools had they replaced all of the cuts. And as we say in our evidence to you, it is absolutely clear that the schools with most children on free school meals, as well as being most disrupted during the pandemic, have also had the greatest level of cuts uh, during that period from 2015 until now. And that has been having material effects. It's meant that class sizes have been edging up throughout the whole period. And so that we've got the, the, the highest secondary class sizes that we've had for 40 years and primary classes heading up as well. That actually, I believe, has an impact on COVID as well. And it's, it's part of the reason why our schools have been more disrupted than others in Europe. Our class sizes are higher and our children are in, uh, are in classes with, which do not have compensatory uh, space either. So social distancing was much harder of any degree in schools in England than it was in schools in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, for example, or in, in Denmark, where they managed to open schools earlier because class sizes were much smaller. And you know, so I'm going off on a point, but in the summer, we issued uh, in June of 2020, we issued a 10 point plan for education recovery, looking at poverty amongst other things, but also making a plea with government last summer in 2020 to mobilize extra spaces, uh, libraries, uh, council offices that weren't being used, village halls, that we could have other classes in to mobilize extra teachers, the supply teachers, the recently retired teachers who could come back and take smaller classes so that we'd have smaller classes, the sort of size they have in Denmark, which would have led to less transmission of the virus and less disruption of education. Sorry, I've just crowbarred that into your question about general education funding. So it was running down during COVID. We are doing work on this. There are some countervailing factors, but school te uh, head teachers are telling us that they are massively out of pocket as a result. They've lost lots of income from, um, from rental, for example. They've often had to uh, cover teachers who've been off on COVID. So there have been huge supply costs that are unanticipated. And so people have run up huge deficits. We think the government needs to be much more generous about that as part of putting right the problem. But then we, need, we are going to need a lot of money uh, no, we're going to need a small amount of money. £15 billion pounds is what Kevin Collins said. And of course, that's a lot of money. But on another, in another way of looking at it, when you look at the money they've, they've wasted on Test Track Trace, when you look at the impact on children's lives, I want to say to you that £15 billion pounds is not a lot of money, but the government is, has only offered a tenth of that so far. Yeah, talking then about the uh, the 15 billion needed for the COVID lost learning recovery. And of course, there was 1.5 billion provided. Um, th there's a theme that's come out um, throughout this inquiry, private testing, private hospitals, private tutors, billion pounds for them. How do teachers feel about this billion pounds being given to private organisations for the, for the catching well, up? We would really wish, sorry. We, we would really wish that that money was in the control of schools, that head teachers and teachers could plan to, for example, to employ another teacher and to reduce some class sizes in the classes that need the help most. So we don't support that, that tutoring method. However, we did engage with Kevin Collins. We thought he was a good appointment by the government, an unusual good decision from the government. We've engaged with Kevin Collins when he was director of education in Tower Hamlets, when he was with the, uh, the, the EEF, a, a body which looked at what works in, in terms of schooling. And so we've engaged with him throughout. And there is lots of good stuff in the plan that he had. But as you just said, they've, they've, only, so far, they've only offered one tenth of what he asked for. And uh, we've been looking at what Joe Biden's offering, what the Netherlands are doing. If you, uh, if you look at the amount per pupil 
Joe Biden's offer would have come to 21 billion pounds uh, in the UK. The Netherlands offer would have come to 18 billion pounds in the UK. Kevin Collins only asked for 15 billion compared with 21 billion, and they've only offered 1.5 billion. Th there's no way we're gonna have a leveling up agenda that is going to cop cope with all of the extra lost education in those northern, in those red wall seats, if you like. There is no way that we can get children through this without a substantial investment from the government to help. Mm. Um, I, I just want to, to add that the education recovery plan that you published in January 2021 is on uh, is going to be on the website because it's attached to your witness statement. And also there's a document which um, I got this afternoon called the Coronavirus Pupils and Schools Unanswered Questions, which as I understand it was uh, published some time ago, but it relates to questions that uh, you and your colleague of the, of the NEU asked the government between mid-March last year and the beginning of May over a six week period. Did you receive any responses to those questions and what is the most important question of those? Uh, I might, this might be a bit of a trick question because you might not have it in front of you. I, I do have it in front of me actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, this was a document that we produced, um, I think in May of 2020, because we started writing to Boris Johnson and to Gavin Williamson uh, at the beginning of March. Uh, and we wrote on several occasions across uh, the period between then and May. And we were asking, because they weren't recommending the closure of schools or the, 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 the lockdown, we were asking questions about what the evidence, what evidence did they have about transmissibility uh, between school children. And obviously the evidence was, was, was developing at that time, but we were seeking to engage with the science of this at all stages, writing questions and just not being completely blanked by the Prime Minister from the, uh, the largest education union in Europe, the largest education union in this country, where we were, we were saying to our members, we want you to volunteer to be in school on the rotors, working with the children of key worker and vulnerable children, even though some members are saying to us, we think this is too risky, but we were saying, no, we've got to get our society through this. So we think, we feel that we were doing, you know, uh, the best we could. And I think, uh, so the, the questions we asked at that time, I think the most significant question we were asking there is what role do schools play in transmission and what role would be able to work on a rotor basis, have on reducing transmission. We know that Sage said in minutes of a meeting in September that having rotor operation in secondary schools where every child was taught every lesson, uh, but sometimes they would be at home, that that would have the same effect on reducing transmission, they thought, as closing the whole of hospitality, which was the big thing they were doing at the time. So that is the, the biggest question we had at that moment. Our biggest question now is um, how we deal with the question of vaccination of secondary school children and why have they removed the prescription on mask wearing. We, we uh, agree with your last witness, that uh, Deeply Gurdasani, that ventilation in schools has been missed and there should be much more investment in ventilation because I, I, we, we, you don't know all of this at the start of a pandemic, but it had become absolutely clear by the time we'd reached June and July that the scientists were all saying the fundamental method of transmission is airborne. And then that they were saying that it can be by very small droplets so that standing two meters away doesn't give you full protection. So standing two meters away gives you huge protection but that the scientists were saying uh, droplets can be produced. And especially if you're in a crowded situation that isn't well ventilated, then standing two meters away doesn't necessarily protect you. So ventilating classrooms to get, uh, to get an airflow is a way of dealing with that. It's a way of mitigating against that mode of transmission. And we think government needs to invest much more in that and they need to do it um, going forward. I mean, fingers crossed that the vaccine will reach a point where transmission stops in our country. But 
if it doesn't, then we could still be in a situation in the autumn where we are sending, even, even if other restrictions are lifted, that we are still sending children home because they are close contacts of another child with the virus and still therefore having huge disruption of education, even in the autumn term. So we want investment in ventilation uh, uh, to, to, to try and help mitigate against that. Mm. Uh, I suppose a very um, stark statistic, which is contained within your evidence, um, is that in the Medway and Kent areas where the Alpha variant, the Kent variant first emerged, the rate of infection uh, more than quadrupled against uh, 10 to 14, amongst 10 to 14 year olds over the course of the second lockdown. And that in the last week of November, secondary attendance in Medway dipped to 38%. And of course- well, yeah, yeah. This, this, is the, this is the problem, isn't it? That even though schools were notionally fully open, uh, attendance was at very low levels in those places. And actually Bolt in Bolton, we've just seen some figures that from, uh, from the current, from, from the spread of the Delta variant, that on one day, uh, just before half term, I think it was, that 22% of primary children were absent and 31% of secondary children were absent in Bolton. So there's still a huge impact. That's not as bad as it was in Medway when 38% was the attendance rate, not the number missing. Only 38% of children were in school, in secondary schools in that week in Medway. And of course, that brings you to the, that's the realization that a variant was spreading very fast. That is why a number of schools wanted to go online for the last week before Christmas and why Greenwich wanted all of its schools to go online for the last week before Christmas. But when the Secretary of State for Education claims he had uh, medical advice that, uh, that, that got him to write to Greenwich threatening uh, legal action against them if their school, if they didn't withdraw their advice for schools to go online. I, I mean, in retrospect, we have to be able to see that Gavin Williamson made that call entirely wrong. The, the, the alpha variant was spreading extremely fast in schools and that led to the increase over the Christmas period, which then led to that huge lockdown that we had to have in January. Kevin Courtney, um, I don't have any other questions for you because I have to send you back to the panel now where there might be some other questions. Thank you very much for your evidence. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. I'm going to ask the panel members if they have any Yes, Professor, please. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Kevin, I want to start by thanking you very much for your witness statement, which was detailed, forensic, and very, very clear in, indeed. And it, uh, it made for very sobering reading. But my question is to make sure that I understand an issue about the mutant, the so-called mutant algorithm. Um, so I'd be grateful if you would tell me if my understanding is correct, because if it is correct, I would like to be certain that our listeners appreciate exactly the implications of this algorithm. So my understanding is that the algorithm used an adjustment for the school. And that means that a student doing a student who was perhaps struggling doing poorly at a high performing school in an affluent area would be marked up and the converse would hold for a child who was doing, a bright child who was doing very, very well indeed, a high flyer, but who was studying at a school with major challenges would be marked down. Is that correct before I go on to the, the, the conclusion from that? Uh Yes, there, there is a huge element of correctness in that. What happened was that teachers were asked to assess each child, but not just to give them a grade to say, I think this child would have scored a B in their GCSEs. As well as allocating a grade, they had to rank the children from, uh, from uh, so th this is the top child in the B, this is the second child in the B category, this is the third child in the B category. And then uh, the algorithm, as you say, it, it mashed the results back to where the national, where the average for that school was. Right. So if there was 
uh, if there was a, a couple of bright, you know, bright in inverted column uh, co uh, commas children in that school that were more than the allocation of A grades that they had the year before, they wouldn't get them this year. So therefore, therefore, Kevin, therefore, the, 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 the obvious implication of all of this is that the educational divide would widen. The, 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 the clear social divide in educational attainment that we see that government after government has, has pledged to try and narrow would actually widen. So this is, this is absolutely invidious. Can I just emphasize that point? Because I think, as I say, it's really important that our, our, our listeners appreciate that this would have actually worsened the chances of bright students and falsely bumped up uh, other, other children and would ultimately therefore have widened the, um, the socioeconomic divide that we see in education that so many teachers have worked so hard for decades to try and, and overcome. I agree. With, I mean, obviously, uh, we were pleased in the end that the, mal the, the algorithm was abandoned, uh, um, but that still, that still led to uh, real. It, that meant that that uh, some schools would have approached the thing, trying to get the results that they thought the algorithm would give them. Others would have put in results that were. Uh, so the bottom line, sorry, sorry to interject, but I know Mr. Mansfield will, wants me to be speedy. Um, sorry yeah. to interject, but the bottom line too is that government did not trust the teachers. That's absolutely right. Thank and you that's very much. what they should have done. Thank you. Uh, right, Dr. Annie. Thank you. Thank you for that um, really powerful testimony. I just pick, want to pick up on the point that you made about ventilation and also this also picks up on the um, point made by the previous um, witness. I would appreciate your perspective because one of the things that we talk about in, in terms of ventilation of, of schools is that of course it'd be really critical for this dealing with this pandemic to mitigate and to reduce transmission given that we don't know how long this journey will be. But also critically, there are co-benefits, right, to other aspects. So I wondered if you could share, perhaps in your experience, pre-pandemic even, um, based on your experience, what you see as potential benefits for, for that. Because we often hear, hear about this from the public health or epidemiological perspective, but I'd be curious from the education perspective, how you see potentially that improved ventilation um, paying off even beyond the pandemic. Sure. Thank you. Uh, well, I will try. I mean, uh, can I say that as well as improving ventilation, we would really like to see smaller class sizes in our country and to have the sorts of class sizes that are the average in Europe. But obviously vent ventilation is very good for dealing with airborne diseases of any sort and COVID is only one airborne disease. It isn't an airborne disease which particularly impacts on children. I mean, you know, that but there are uh, flu affects more children. So, uh, so dealing, if it helps with that, that would be a co-benefit. But rooms that are stuffy lead to children that can't concentrate as well. And sometimes the way we deal with that is by opening all the windows uh, without having a proper, efficient, or ecologically sound. Uh, heating system and so you, you either have a really stuffy classroom where children find it difficult to learn or a very cold classroom where children will also find it difficult to learn so a good ventilation system can improve the pedagogy the learning as well as suppressing some of the other airborne diseases that might spread thank you that's such an important point i think that you've teased out there because we talk about the health benefits but also seeing that kind of building control as actually helping to address the educational in inequities is, a, is, is an additional benefit that it's important to tease out so thank you. I think there's time for one quick one Dr Davis. <laughs> thank you, thank you that was really interesting. Um, we've heard from a number of people that, um, that at the NHS went into this pandemic in a poor state to deal with it so in brief, do you think that education went into this pandemic in a poor state to deal with it? Yes, I do. The exam system 
was clearly very brittle because of the changes that have been made across recent years to remove almost all elements of teacher assessment and coursework from it. That was Michael Gove's initiative in 2014 to move it just all to final exams. So that's just one example that when we had to do the assessment of the children for last summer, the fact that it removed teacher assessment from the course made the whole system more brittle. But the, uh, the, 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 high, the very high class sizes have proved to be a real problem as well, we think, compared with Denmark in terms of the amount of disruption of education. So that's just another example where, uh, yeah, where, where, we, where a, a better built, a better resourced education system would have coped with this uh, better. Thank you. Can I thank you very much? <clears throat> I don't normally do this, but I'm going to give evidence which you might like to uh, consider. About a year ago, a school in Canada, in fact, it was a Scottish head, headmaster who decided that ventilation was the most important issue and he moved the whole school outside under canvas. And that's how it's remained. You may know about it, but anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in as a footnote to what you've had to say and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And now back to Lorna Hackett for the next witness, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mansfield. The next witness is Stephen Cowan. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cowan. Thank you very much for attending this evening. Um, I have a witness statement before me, which is dated the, forgive me, uh, 14th of June, um, which is signed by you, confirming that the statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief. Um, and uh, is that still correct? Yes. Thank you. Could you uh, tell the panel and everybody watching what your occupation is, please? I'm a uh, local councillor, but I'm the leader of the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. Thank you. Now, um, we've heard that just now that teachers weren't trusted to allocate exam marks to children's papers. We've heard before that primary care wasn't trusted with test trace on isolate. Was central government any less forgiving with local government? Um, and if that, how, how was your role uh, in respect to this pandemic with, uh, in respect of local government? It's hard to answer whether it was a question of trust or whether there was a question of priority. But in the early days of the pandemic, it looked like um, the government's focus wasn't on the COVID pandemic. Um, and, and really, that, there's a very centralised system in Britain where we all look to see what Westminster's telling us to do and uh, somewhat usually obediently try and follow that to the best of our ability. And in Feb certainly by February, when uh, many people had gone, uh, schools had gone skiing in Italy, and Italy was having their first wave in Europe's first wave of the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of direction coming out of central government. There seemed to be an awful lot of assurance. But when you looked around at what was going on in South Korea or in Italy, or indeed in other countries like Germany, the Czech Republic, what the governor of California was beginning to say and do, it, it's Britain seemed at odds with what was going on in other liberal democracies. And I'm not sure it was a case of trust. It was a case of their head seemed to be in a different space to where I thought it needed to be. So, so what did you do uh, locally to ensure that your resident population was protected when this all came about? So we, we, we had lots of conversations about what was going on from January onwards. Uh, I had lots of conversations with officials who at the time were looking to the center for advice and were passing on that assurance to me um, that it should be okay. Um, but when it became evident that other liberal democracies were taking different courses of action, uh, and certainly around the time of the school holidays, when I was aware, you know, I think one of, my, one of the people in my office said her kids were, were skiing in Northern Italy. <laughs> um, I, I, I sort of, I, I called the chief executive in and said, I, I don't think the government's head's in the right place. Uh, the prime ministers didn't seem to be, he wasn't talking about it. And he's a very strong leader of his party and therefore the government 
Um, and if he wasn't engaged, I suspect if the government wasn't engaged uh, or it had a different agenda, and it's hard to know, uh, we, you know what was going on. I read what people are saying in the press, uh, but it was evident on the ground the government wasn't on top of this issue in January, February. And so in February, I instructed our chief executive to prepare to move Hammersmith and Fulham onto a civic emergency footing on the basis that if what I thought was going to happen, which is the same type of thing that was going on in Italy and looked like it was and had gone on in China, was going to come to Britain, it was most likely to come to London as you know, a, a multicultural uh, city, 400 languages spoken, one of the world's biggest airports. It, it just seemed evident to me it would come to London. And therefore I asked her to prepare to move us onto a civic emergency footing and to work out what we would do to, to scope out the different enterprises we would need to come up with in order to rise to the challenge. So they began to prepare to do that in mid-February. And I think we became the first council in, in the country to formally move on to a civic emergency footing on the 13th of March, where we shut down all meetings. We set up, uh, we, had a, we appointed an interim director of COVID-19 response. We had an emergency uh, uh, operation moved into, uh, we cleared an office out um, and, and, and set up an emergency operations room um, and I think the most important thing we did is, you know, I gathered, I mean, I was chairing day to day meetings after that, but we gathered the officials and said, look, I think every piece of advice we've got so far has been wrong. And so what we're going to do is not look to the centre, we're going to look internationally at what we think is the best advice, what is the best evidence, and we're going to act on it without fear or favour. And I expect you know, and I am telling you, that's the brief of this administration. And we were very fortunate to employ some amazing officials who, I th and I think that liberated them to go and do that. And so what we then did afterwards was to set up a wide variety of different operations, which had the sole message of we are going to do everything we can to protect people and, uh, and, and all the different challenges they arise. And it was a very odd period because it was challenge after challenge just bubbling up and we decided to act on the side of caution rather than anything else. So that's what we did from that period onwards. And certainly that's what I raised with my colleagues across London. So by the 22nd of uh, March, uh, we'd been a number of meetings. I'd asked for a meeting on the 13th of March with all London's Labour leaders uh, of councils. By the 22nd of March, um, People were saying, why don't you know, I was suggesting we wrote to the prime minister to demand a lockdown yes. and to clarify for anyone that doesn't have that etched in their memory. That's the Sunday before the Monday when lockdown was the, 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 tw the 21st of March. I was I was saying, we, you know, if my colleagues suggested I did the first draft of the letter, which I did. Um, and uh, once they saw the draft, every Labour leader agreed to sign the letter uh, by Sunday morning. Um, and then Councillor Peter John, who was the leader of London councils, um, went and got the Conservative group and the Liberal Democrat group to also put their names to the letter. And they made some minor adjustments. It's in the pack. But what that meant was there was a letter that had gone to the Prime Minister demanding a lockdown, um, explaining that we didn't understand why Britain was out of sync with other liberal democracies. And... Um, and we, I think, agreed with the Conservatives that we would not embarrass the government, which is, I think, their request. Uh, certainly not in the short term, we wouldn't have done that. What we were most interested to do was to get the lockdown in place. The same on the Saturday, I closed the parks. We had, it was a particularly hot spring last year, as you recall, <laughs> somewhat in contrast to this year. And uh, the reports from our parks is people were just mixing uh, extremely freely doing everything you'd expect to do on a hot summer day when those early spring uh, sun rays break in and warm the bones. So we were getting an awful lot of people being very in very close contact. And there were two risks there. There was one, the risk that it was spreading the disease. Um, you know, we later learned being outside was better, but if you're in close contact then the aerosol spray you breathe out, um, we believed was dangerous. Um, and then the other thing that 
dawned on me was we were asking people to make a very surreal change in their life because up until that point we would lived a normal life and the stuff we've done for the last 18 months was the stuff of science fiction movies bad ones but you know all the same science fiction movies so to say to people you're going to stay in your house you're not going to be able to go out you've got to keep six feet away from people you've got to um wash your hands if you touch anything that might have had uh some some virus on it you know these were huge changes and people understandably i think were in a sense of denial about that impending change uh and the horror of not going out um and part of the reason we closed the parks was also under to underline because at the time when i closed the parks on the saturday the 21st there was no lockdown and we weren't sure we were going to get them and we kept the parks closed until the Thursday because the lockdown was announced on the Monday, the 23rd. And on that Thursday, the legal measures had been taken by Parliament to allow us to begin to police uh, social distancing and other things uh, th that, that we did. So I would say that period was one of everybody. I don't think it was a case of everybody really trying to grasp what was going on and our take in Hammersmith and Fulham was that the government hadn't done that and indeed there appeared to be a pattern where it consistently didn't do that. I initially thought that was because they just weren't focused on this. We had a very powerful prime minister whose attention was elsewhere. He'd gone to a rugby game and shook hands and had been boasting about shaking hands with people in a hospital. Um, and all these to me were indications that his head wasn't in the place we needed it to be. Uh, so the Dominic Cummings revelations later offered a different slant on it, which is maybe they were going for herd immunity, which I know they now deny. But um, it was evident, what I know on the ground is that, that we weren't getting a lot of direction or indeed um, support from the government. Now, that did change um, after they... Um, I think very quickly they began to organise meetings with the Secretary of State, and um, and I think that was on the Tuesday. So that would be what the 24th, I think was the first meeting with Secretary of State. Um, and I mean, to give you an idea of how unprepared, you know, how, how different everything was, the first calls we had as London council leaders, we all had to phone in. And when, afterwards, we were all a bit shocked to find we'd had like 35 quid bills <laughs> because no one had heard of Teams or Zoom at the time. So it really was a very different time pre-COVID. We hadn't really grasped the different way of working. Um, but I think there was a call or as a team meeting on the 24th. And from then on, there were regular meetings. And it appeared very encouraging from government. Uh, Robert Janerick famously said, um, spend what you will, we will cover the cost, which later didn't happen, but he certainly said that in one of the meetings. Uh, I think we've got that, the date of that, I think was uh, is in the public realm. I had said to our chief executive, we will take every single measure in February necessary to protect the public, irrespective of cost, and we will work out what we do about the money later. Um, and I think that was the right approach. And certainly the government then echoed that, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in mid-March. Um, but that early period, I would summarise, as the government just wasn't on it. <laughs> so, um, I just want to draw uh, people's attention to, uh, there are appendices to your witness statement, one of which is uh, a copy of that email uh, from you on the 13th of March, uh, in which um, you talk about to your to, uh, staff at Hammersmith and Fulham Council, uh, about the COVID-19 pandemic and the World Health Organization having declared that. And then there is also at Appendix B, uh, the email from the Chair of London Councils to the Prime Minister, which you've already described. And, and tellingly, this is on the, this is Sunday, the 22nd of March at 7.17 p.m. And you ask, uh, you and all um, leaders of councils across uh, London ask for number one, instructing all except non-essential workers, perhaps a category similar to key workers, to stay at home with simple and clear rules about what that means. Number two, closing all non-essential public facing business premises. And number three, consideration of the introduction of fines for people who breach the lockdown measures. And that was in fact before uh, the national lockdown. That's right, yes. Yeah. So and we in Hammersmith and Fulham, um, the email you saw went to uh, councillors, to staff, 
and indeed to members of the public in residence associations and community groups. Um, and it was really setting out that we'd cancelled all meetings, uh, which was seen as controversial at the time, oddly. Um, we were asking staff to stay at home and to work from home. Um, and we were beginning to take the measures we thought to lead people into a, a, a lockdown and to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would you say the importance of uh, local knowledge in protecting residents' health during a pandemic is um, from, from your um, side of things as a, in local councils and also in protecting your constituents after a pandemic? Well, it's an interesting, it, it, it really brings home the sort of governmental situation in Britain because we're a very centralised society even after devolution to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. You know, if, if you look in England, it, it's still run by Westminster and local government has no real constitutional structure within, um, with, 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 because we have no written constitution. So, so successive governments either give power or take it away from local government um, at different times. Um, and, and that creates a, a curious culture to operate in. My take on that period was I was very proud of my colleagues across London um, for rising to the challenge. Um, I don't think I've ever worked so closely with other London councils, and it really was the councils who were in the front line um, in working out what we were going to do despite what government uh, wasn't doing. Um, and, um, and my experience is clearly across London, but that, that was the consistent pattern. Now in Hammersmith and Fulham, which is the area I'm directly responsible for, we, we just took a series of measures because our, our, our creed came, don't worry about the money, act without fear or favour. And that, like any creed, needs to be repeated over and over again. But it did empower and liberate our officials to do certain things. So I, I had uh, learned in early April, for example, that um, and I was at this point chairing day, daily COVID meetings with an you know with an emergency team, uh, and we'd learned in early April that the death rate in Lombardy was so high because the Italians had placed uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic people into care homes. I uh, I think I learned, I think with, as soon as I put the phone down to the person who advised me of that, which was my special advisor, who happened to have a brother who was a journalist in Italy, which is how I found out. Um, I phoned our director of public health, uh, our, our director of uh, adult social care, and said, is this what's happening in the UK? And she said, yes, uh, we have four care homes in Hammersmith and Fulham, all of them privately operated. Uh, the, the NHS are indeed putting people into the care homes. In the Chiswick care home, we've lost 24 patients. This was in, this, I think, the second week in April. Um, in the St. Vincent's care home, two care workers have died, one of which was only 28. I think the other was uh, in her 70s. Uh, and straight away, I, I, I said, well, we need to close the care homes. What powers do we have? And we did have powers to close them. Uh, but we also had, we had hard powers to close, but we also had the soft power of persuasion and offering help. And the biggest insight for me was when she said, you know, to be a nurse, it takes four years of training. To be a doctor, it takes at least seven, depending on your level of uh, uh, expertise. But to be a care home worker, you can sometimes just have a few hours of training uh, and at best a few days. Um, and having people dealing with a, a large number of people dying from a, 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 during a pandemic, people just simply weren't qualified for. So we quickly began to work out what would we do? We offered, we decided to put free PPE uh, into all our care homes and we, we, we weren't sure if we charged them, whether they would use it or not. So we just said, let's just deal with that later. We uh, offered training and gave training um, we introduced testing and we had this amazing director of public health who I think really was, she really did fly once she knew that, you know, you know she was to act without fear or favour. And she arranged for Charing Cross Hospital uh, to, to provide PPE and she, and she arranged a first of its kind testing and tracing system. So we were very quickly testing and tracing all patients irrespective of whether they showed symptoms. Um, 
and taking a whole bunch of measures to sort of essentially take control of the care homes way before it really became an issue. And then we were raising this across London. We were raising this across London and in many different fora that um, that was just that characterised that period in time. Um, so throughout that time, I think local government really did rise. I heard your previous speaker talking about the actions of the leader of uh, Islington and Greenwich in closing their schools, which was exactly the right thing to do, which they did much later on. But again, central government sort of wanted to knock them back and tell them not to act. Um, but if you look at the witness statements I put in, there were many actions we took in Hammersmith and Fulham. For example, we had banners up saying, we're telling people to wear masks on the basis that I protect you, you protect me um, in May. And while the government was still dithering and, and looking at the evidence on that, and I don't think they actually made a decision on mask wearing until I think, was it August, September? So, so we were acting very quickly on information we were taking internationally. And the whole organization was orientated towards keeping people safe. So for example, we'd canceled every single meeting, which meant we had a load of planning clerks and um, uh, other officials who we quickly retrained and, and, and put them into to organizing, for example, a or commu community aid network, which built up a, a program of 3000 residents who we coordinated to knock on doors, they, doing everything from your shopping to phoning up for a chat if people were depressed. Um, so we had a lot of our whole focus in that period very quickly it was a sort of wartime operation moved into protecting people during the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, there was a lot of activity, some of which I've tried to capture in my statement because I knew I would not say everything in my verbal uh, evidence. Well, yes, thank you. And th there's a lot of really interesting information in there. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm going to hand you back to the panel because I'm conscious of the time. But yes, what do you think should happen next? How can... <laughs> local councils work together with local NHS bodies and campaigners to make themselves and the local NHS more resilient against the current policies of central government? Um, I think I mean, there's two sides to that. In the short term, I think the relationships we developed with the health services, the care homes, uh, the voluntary groups, um, and to a degree central government, we're, we're much stronger during the COVID period, central government probably being the weakest link. Um, but the health services rose to the challenge as much as anyone else did, uh, he heroically. And there was a very symbiotic working experience, which I, in, in, certainly I can say took place in Hammersmith and Fulham. And as I understand from my colleagues, took place at all levels, teachers. It, it really was something where the public sector ethos came into its own at a ground level. And I think the lesson for that is if you empower people, then they will rise to the challenge. And uh, I think people were at the best in the public sector at that point in time. I think the longer term is, you know, it was up to me, I would, I would have some constitutional settlement that actually locked, you know, that actually gave local government real powers because it was, a, it was ridiculous throughout that we hate, had to wait for local, for, for national government to act. The, the worst example of that, if you don't, if you forgive me for just sharing it, but I, I'm quite keen to get this information into the inquiry. On Sunday, the 13th of December, uh, we were called to an emergency meeting, a Teams meeting, obviously, um, to hear evidence from the Director of Public Health for London, Professor Kevin Fenton. And uh, Professor Fenton showed us a variety of slides. I've known Professor Fenton for some years. He's one of the most unflappable people I've ever come across. Uh, and one of the most calming people to be around. He looked genuinely anxious as he explained that the pandemic had moved into an ex exponential level, that we had eight days to close, uh, to, 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 to take measures to stop it. And within that, after that eight days, he believed, looking at the evidence um, and having talked with his colleagues, that the, the pandemic would be uncontrollable for the first half of 2021. Um, 
and that we'd have very few measures, tools in the box, as he put it, to control the pandemic other than a very hard lockdown throughout much of 2021 and predicted that if we did not take those measures immediately, um, the second wave would kill far more than the first wave. Um, it was an interesting meeting because there was a Labour group meeting first and followed by an all council, London councils meeting, so all council leaders. And there was universal agreement in both meetings. So even from the Conservative and Liberal Democrat groups, as well as the Labour groups, that we should call on the government to immediately move to lockdown plus um, um, and, can, and as, as, as one Conservative council leader said, who I wasn't expected to say it, we should cancel Christmas and that needed to be the message to the public. Now that didn't happen. Um, and I think on the 20th of December, uh, I read in the Guardian, Matt Hancock saying the disease was now out of control. Everything Professor Fenton said would happen on Sunday the 13th of December has happened since. And I think that if local government had the power to put a lockdown in London, then I don't think we'd have had the second wave anywhere near as bad. We'd have saved a lot of lives. And um, I, I'm so, going to have to stop you, stop, sorry, just, just finish what your point. Yeah, and, and just not, not just in Britain, you know, what they call the UK variant in the US, which we call the Kent variant, uh, was the biggest infection in, in, in America throughout that period too. So I think really it's about trusting people on the ground and the government, again, failed to have its head in the right place or to act. And I think, you know, the Prime Minister was more focused on being the person that gave people Christmas, rather, again, rather than focused on the science of controlling the second wave. Mm. Um, Steve Cowan, thank you so much for your evidence. I'm going to hand you back to Michael Mansfield, QC, um, and the rest of the panel who may have some questions for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr Cowan. I do have a, a question, really, it's to clarify matters. You've been talking about constitutional issues, which are extremely important, I understand that. But the, we've heard a lot of evidence over the past four months, uh, much of which relates to the economic and social situation that pre-existed before the pandemic yeah now and what the pandemic has done has been to target essentially the very areas which are most vulnerable and which were hit very hard before the pandemic and one of the areas hit very hard before the pandemic was local government with in some cases 60 percent cuts in the services which would normally be able to support the people being hit by the pandemic. Now, uh, that I, I, it's a bit of a long-winded introduction, but I'm interested in the observations about, oh, don't worry about the money. Well, wait a minute. Um, are you worried about the money? I mean, what is going to now happen? Uh, political empowerment is one thing. Another is economic empowerment. Is, is the lost ground going to be made up? Are you happy about that? What, what, what are the... What does the future hold? So in 2010, um, the London Borough of Hampstead and Fulham's total budget was £184 million uh, when uh, Nick Clegg and David Cameron introduced austerity, um, which we've had ever since. Our budget last February, which we agreed, is £124 million. Um, so there's huge cuts we've experienced. Um, and when we're, we're indicative of what's gone on across local government. Um, so it is a genuine concern. We were making the point, don't worry about the money on the basis that we prioritise human life over money. And we would work, if we had to, we would go to government and argue that we'd spent the money on COVID. And to be fair, much of the money we have spent, they did pay. Not all of it, but much of it. Um, and so they have done that. But there is the wider point you're making, uh, Chair, which is that um, it's unsustainable for local government to be continuously cut this way. In Hammersmith and Fulham, we have some of the poorest people in the north of our borough in northwestern Europe. And what we saw in people living in overcrowded conditions, uh, people without technology in their homes, people without spaces for their children to do homework, 
we saw, for example, those children as just one example suffering more than anybody else. Um, and we took measures. We provided computers. Our teachers were brilliant and rose to the challenges. And we had to take measures to deal with it. But it's not like if you have, are fortunate enough to have a house and a room for the children to do homework in, and maybe you can even help them with the homework, then it's a, some people just didn't have that facility available to them. So it did show very starkly the difference in life opportunities that children had um, and how those were curtailed initially when the pandemic hit and would have been if it hadn't been for people rising to the challenge on the front line. Is there any other question from the panel? I'm going to say, we're a bit pressed for time. I'm very sorry, because it's very interesting. But may I thank you for your time and uh, with best wishes for the future for, for your borough. Thank, thank you. you. And may I go back to Lorna Hackett, please, for the next witness. I think this may be a, a red one. I'm not sure. That's correct. The um, next witness is Matt Weston MP, who is the Labour Party MP for Warwick and Leamington. Uh, he has provided uh, a witness statement because he is unable to attend and give evidence. But uh, as has been agreed uh, with him, uh, he has allowed us to read, not all, but part of his statement. He, he's allowed us to read all of it, but uh, because of time, I'm only going to read the salient parts. I am the Labour Party MP for Warwick and Leamington and have been since June 2017. I'm also Labour's Shadow Universities Minister. As a constituency MP, I've been engaged in the various parliamentary debates and votes relating to the pandemic since early 2020. I've supported many constituents who have faced issues resulting from the pandemic and various lockdowns during that time too. More pertinently, the COVID mega lab announced by the government to process tests is being built in my constituency. In March 2020, I urged the County Council to prioritise social care provision in the pandemic and protection within care homes. And since June 2020, I've been calling for an inquiry into the excess deaths in Warwickshire. In November 2020, it was announced that Leamington Spa had been selected as the site of one of two new mega labs in the UK for large scale COVID-19 diagnostic testing. I had no prior engagement within the Department of Health or my local authorities regarding the project, despite being the local MP. In fact, I was sent a letter by Health Minister Lord Bethel on the 17th of November with advance notice of the announcement made on the previous day, the 16th of November. The other lab was going to be based in Scotland. Work on the Scottish lab has stopped while the UK government assesses the long-term demand for it. The government initially said the project would create up to 2,000 jobs. More recently, they've said around 18,000 people. They initially said it would be opening in early 2021. This later changed to spring 2021. Spring is now ending and there is still no opening date that the government will provide to me. Meanwhile, I still have constituents contacting me who have been recruited to work at the lab who don't have a start date. This includes people who left other jobs having been originally told it would open in early January and are now without income. I recently challenged the Health Secretary in the House of Commons, asking him to tell us what is going on and can he confirm when the place will open. He refused to provide me with an answer. I've written to Lord Bethel several times to provide answers, uh, but no one can give me a start date or explain the delay. My most recent letter sent to him in March has not been responded to. Keep our NHS public have been instrumental in trying to throw some light onto this project. I must commend Pat McGee's report entitled Mega Laboratory and Limiting Spa, a Trojan Horse for a Private System. Pat is chair of Coventry Keep Our NHS Public and a former state registered biomedical scientist, previously employed by Coventry and Warwickshire Pathology Services. The report says that the government has contracted a private company called Medax to run the lab and that the contract was awarded without being advertised or put out for tender, in much the same way as happened with numerous PPE contracts. I'm aware of three other private companies involved with at least the recruitment of staff, Blue Arrow, Lorien and SRG Talent. I've asked the government for details of the involvement of private companies, but have so far drawn a blank. The government continues to claim it is publicly owned and will be operated by DHSC as part of the NHS Test and Trace Laboratory Network. There is a clear lack of transparency, waste and cronyism surrounding this government's contracting process throughout this pandemic, which equally applies to this project. The report also questions why the government chose to set up a brand new laboratory rather than expand on existing NHS pathology services in Coventry and Warwickshire. 
This is a key question which deserves to be answered by the government. It also raises concerns regarding lack of regulation, accreditation and quality standards of the facility and its employees, which fall far short of the requirements within NHS-based laboratories. I've heard from scientists who fear the lack of regulation, poorly qualified staff and mismanagement at the facility could be reminiscent of the issues with the Milton Keynes laboratory. I've no answers on how much this is all costing the taxpayer, and the government have admitted to me that some staff and suppliers are subjected to non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality clauses or specific terms of employment in place, which only adds to the secrecy surrounding this project. To add fuel to the flames, earlier this year there was an outbreak of COVID-19 amongst the staff currently contracted to work at the site to get it up and running. At least 25 employees tested positive. It is an embarrassment that the government cannot even protect staff working on the site of a lab being set up specifically to provide large scale COVID-19 diagnostic testing. As you can see from my statement, I effectively have three main concerns regarding this project. Number one, a total lack of transparency. Number two, privatization of NHS services. And number three, delay of the project. We now need complete transparency. There have been too many failures and too much taxpayers' money squandered by this government for us to allow ministers to avoid accountability in the way they are at the moment. Uh, and then underneath, I, Matt Weston, confirmed that this statement is true to the best of my knowledge and belief, and that was the 11th of June and signed with his wet signature. Now, uh, the, that uh, witness statement will be available on the uh, People's COVID Inquiry website, uh, if you'd like to read it. Uh, but the next witness is a live witness, and her name is uh, Jean Adamson. Hello, is Jean Adamson there? I think she's on mute. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. Sorry about that. That's all right. I, no, no problem. Um, thank you for your. Break. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Thank you for your witness statement. The uh, the witness statement that I have here is dated the twelfth of June, twenty twenty one, and you confirm uh, above your signature that uh, you confirm that the opinions you've expressed represent your true and complete opinions on the matters to which they refer. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Could you tell the panel what your uh, occupation is and also uh, the capacity in which you've appeared today uh, for the inquiry? Okay, um, I'm here today uh, representing the bereaved, COVID-19 bereaved families for justice group. So I am a, a citizen uh, witness. Um, my, uh, my, my occupation is that of a independent CQC consultant. So um, I work with uh, health and social care providers um, and support them to, to meet regulatory standards. Um, so it's, it's all about um, um, making improvements, improvements to quality of care um, and sustainability of, of, of that um, high, high quality care. So yes, that's, uh, that's what I do. Okay. So my, my questions to you are going to sort of uh, straddle both both aspects. Um, but in the first instance, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the fact that you're you're personally bereaved um, because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, and a little bit about uh, your your father? Yes, um, my dad died in April last year during the first wave. Um, he was ninety eight years old and had been in um, a care home for about 18 months. He was first admitted into, a care, into the care home following a stroke um, in September 2018. He had the stroke and he was diagnosed um, soon after that with uh, having a brain tumour. So he was placed on end of life care and, um, and he couldn't go back to independent living because the effects of stroke had left him debilitated somewhat. So um, he went into a care home in December 2018 and he um, on end of life care. Um, and, um, you know, the doctors had given him three to six months to live. And um, he also, well, he subsequently went on to to live for another 18 months uh, until the time when he contracted COVID and died. 
uh, he he was a he was a strong man, um, very robust, robust in uh, in in his uh, physique, you know, strong, and and he was also very robust in character. He was a um, he he's a Windrush pioneer. Describe him as such. He came here in 1956 from Barbados and um, hardworking. Uh, spent, you know, most of his life working here. And then, um, you know, he he loved to play music in his spare time. He would play the guitar and the piano um, and serenade his his grandchildren um, as, as in his later years. You know, his his latter years. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, yes, I mean, he meant everything to us as a family. And um, it, it was, it, you know, it, it feels as if he was taken away from us so cruelly. Uh, we didn't have an opportunity to, to say goodbye. Um, I was fortunate enough, however, that he was on the ground floor of the care home. So we were able to go and speak to him uh, through the window so he could hear, you know, he could hear us speak and we could communicate on, um, in, on that level. Uh, but he wasn't, he'd lost the power of speech. So, you know, it was, it was sort of very frustrating that, you know, I couldn't just hold his hand and, and, and be more tactile, but that's how it was. So we've been left um, as a family bereft of course, and um, the grief has been compounded by the, by the, by the lack of um, clarity and, and the, you know, the, 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 we've been left with, you know, wanting answers to why, you know, I, I need to understand why and our members need to understand why why our loved ones died in a place where we expected them to be safe. Well, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to, to cut across you there. Um, our, our deepest sympathies um, are with you and your family um, for the loss of your father. Um, I, I, I'd like um, to bring you on to um, your experience of trying to get answers about your father's death from the care home in which um, he was resident and your attempts to obtain information under the Freedom of Information Act from the Care Quality Commission. Yes, I, I, I made, um, uh, after my, my father passed and I, I made a complaint, um, this is probably about four or five months afterwards, um, to the care home. Um, formal complaint asking for answers to a number of questions um, around the use of PP in the home, um, hospital discharges into the home, you know, did they have any, um, you know, during what period of time and, you know, searching questions, uh, was the care home conducive to um, uh, containing, um, you know, the the the, the uh, containing crosses, preventing the the spread of uh, the transmission of infection. So a number of areas that I was seeking answers for. Mm -hmm. I also asked for my father's uh, a, a copy of my father's care records. Um, now I got some answers, but. I was still largely left unsatisfied because um, they weren't able to answer questions around the number, for example, the number of COVID related deaths in the home. Mm -hmm. And I know that there were others because I did speak to um, the deputy manager at the home. Mm -hmm. um, this was after my father died. And I asked her, oh, right, you know, have, have there been any other uh, d COVID related deaths in the home and um, initially she said no and then I sort of you know bolt slightly because I I know that there were other cases because we the the, the care manager um, had written 
to to us uh, to to relatives saying that there there were cases in the home so we knew that anyway eventually she said well we had two deaths you know from covid so so it was kind of you know i could see there straight away that there was a there was a lack of transparency um and and honesty um so anyway um i i um i also uh didn't um i also got um they, they, they didn't answer the question about the the hospital discharges and they didn't answer the, num the question about the number of covid deaths and they didn't give me um an unredacted copy copy of my father's notes um i didn't actually get back to them they offered me a meeting to come in or, or to meet it would have been on uh, uh, through uh, zoom um, and I, I didn't, I just felt so, um, I just felt, I just felt as if I didn't have the fight in me, you know, I, and, I, and I just left it. I was really feeling quite, you know, worn down at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I uh, joined the bereaved families uh, group. Uh, it was around May last year, I think I joined, and um, I was able to to gain, uh, you know, to, to to gain quite a bit of support from the group. In fact, I find it a mutually supportive environment, and uh, with my background as well, I was able to support other members uh, and make a contribution to the group, um, helping other members to to challenge uh, the uh, uh, care homes or, you know, the facility um, in which they'd lost their loved ones. Because we, we all share the one thing in common is that we, we're we looking for answers and, you know, we, we haven't been able to get answers to our questions. And it was very disappointing. Um, we feel very let down by the Care Quality Commission as the health and social care regulator for England, we expected that they would be supportive of uh, relatives, you know, bereaved families. Um, and what actually happened was that they, they took a position whereby they refused to release the number of COVID related deaths in individual care homes, because we know the national numbers, but what we wanted as families, what we want as families is to understand um, what, what actually happened in, in the care homes, you know, where, where we lost our loved ones. We need to understand, you know, how many people died from COVID, um, you know, amongst other things. And, you know, I recognise that it's not the only measure of a quality of a care home, but it is an important measure. And, you know, we feel that the CQC have, have really let us down and, and that, in fact, they have sought really to protect the commercial interests of the care sector. Um, rather than um, be open and honest and transparent to us, the public, you know, brief families um, and, the, and the public in general, um, and, and, and protect, protect the public from unsafe practices um, in, in um, you know, in the health and social care sector. So, 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 I feel that the, uh, the, the CQC's position really had become untenable mm -hmm. um, and that they couldn't really maintain the stance that they were taking, um, which essentially they were hiding behind the FOI exemptions um, and using that as a reason to justify withholding the data that that we were asking for. Um, um, 
it's not ju just uh, for people that are that would like to see this there are appendices to your witness statement aren't there with the um freedom of information act request that you submitted on the 15th of january with your yes. uh, with your um subgroup lead uh, your co-lead katie sexton yes so, correct yes um, and and the as i understand it there was the response that you received um effective from that request in January, effectively sought to justify why you shouldn't have access to that data. Um, but as I understand it, you you now have, um, th there's a U-turn in that decision, isn't there? Yes, um, yes. So when, can we, when can we expect um, the information? Okay, they, they have given us a date um, after six months of um, negotiations, um, I, I guess I would call it ne negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, they've given us a date for the release of the data, which is the 21st of July, mm -hmm. so next month. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we've been fighting for this for, for six months. So mm -hmm. it feels like quite a victory. So we're very pleased mm -hmm. that, um, that this will be happening at last. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it really took <laughs> quite a lot um, of um, persuasion, pressure, you know, we had to really apply pressure on the CQC to make, make this U-turn, make this decision. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, we finally got there. So this is just very recent. It's just happened in the last week. So it's all quite new. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so that's, that's due to happen mm -hmm. um, in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, because we, we're, we're short on time and I, I'm, I'd like to be able to give the panel an opportunity to ask you questions as well. Sure. I just, I wanted to ask you what your views are on the public in, uh, inquiry that's being announced for March 2022. Will it, will it make a difference? Do you feel confident that it's going to find the truth? The first thing I'd like to say about that is that it's far too late. We need a public inquiry now um, mm -hmm. and we need it soon, very soon. Um, you know, we have the Delta variant now, which is rising um, exponential, exponentially, sorry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how many more people need to die how many more lives need to be lost to this virus before we start to learn lessons um, and, and and prevent further deaths um, tragedies i mean we have a, a, a tragedy on a national scale unprecedented in our times and still the government are dragging their feet um, with this so um Yes, yeah, so, 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 so time, you know, the time needs to be now. And, uh, you know, in fact, we could even have, I mean, we've been asking for a rapid review um, to, to, to start with so that we can, you know, we can get the process underway quick, quickly, you know, of, of looking at what's happened, what went wrong, um, you know, why it went wrong, uh, start to make recommendations and learn lessons um, <clears throat> and even if we could have that rapid review that that would be a start because I recognize that uh, setting up a, a public inquiry a statutory public inquiry takes time you know it, it's not going to happen in a few weeks time it takes months to set it up so um, so that's what so what that's what we as a group um, are calling for um, and um you know, we, we, we're hoping that, um, that the government will do a U-turn and, and that we, we will have some affirmative action taken uh, soon, sooner rather than later. Well, Jean Adamson, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there because we're running out of time. We've still got another witness, but I would like to hand you back to the panel. Uh, I'm deeply sorry for your loss and thank you very much for your evidence this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one, please, if I may. Uh, we're very interested to know what response you've had from the proposal for a rapid review. Um, 
we we haven't had a response um not not that i'm aware of anyway um we we've been calling for it for some time now but we haven't actually had any formal response from the government on that Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. So, you know, there is a way in which you can do it, but uh, we'll come to that in our proposals in a couple of weeks' time. Anyone okay. else got a... Thank you. Sorry. Anyone else got a question at the moment? No. Yes, Dr. Davis. Thank you. Um, it's interesting. You are certainly not the first person to give a uh, wit uh, witness here who has had no reply from the government or the Department of Health when they've written with their concerns. And I find it absolutely shocking that the government has not bothered to reply to people. Um, I don't know whether I missed it in what you said, but do you understand, it's so shocking to doctors to hear what's happening with the, with the Care Quality Commission around this, um, because they're certainly very quick to come down on the NHS like a ton of bricks. Um, do you um, know why the Care Quality Commission have been tiptoeing around what's been happening in um, privately run care homes uh, around COVID? During our um, conversations with the CQC, they made it very clear that they are anxious about the collapse of the care sector. Um, and by releasing the data, um, they fear that this will um, cause the, the, the care sector to collapse and people will not, will, you know, remove their loved ones from care homes and, you know, the, 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 the care homes will uh, suffer commercially, uh, close down, and then there'll be a lack of beds, uh, care, care home beds um, uh, around the, around the, the, the country. Um, and it's all very fear-based, um, but, but all the while protecting the commercial interests of, of care homes. And that's been very clear to me, you know, sitting around the table with the CQC, um, you know, senior people at CQC, that th this, is, this is their, they're preoccupied, they're absolutely preoccupied and petrified of, of that outcome. Um, and, you know, I find that it's just beggar's belief, actually, that, you know, where is the commitment to us as the, you know, the public, that the, the reason why they were set up, you know, the very reason why they exist is to protect the public um, and, and to have our interests at heart. Um, but that clearly isn't the case. Um, so, um, I, I question their motives. I question their motives and I question their, their arm's length uh, status or, or uh, the, 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 this arm's length from, from, the, from the, the, the government. And I think that, um, you know, this is a, a political, it was a political decision, I believe, um, because if they release the data and, and, and their fears were realized, the care sector collapsed, then this would pl place a large burden on the government. And that's, mm, that's, how, that's how I see it. Well, <clears throat> may I thank you very much for spending time with us tonight in a very difficult context for you personally, but thank you and best wishes, especially for your campaign. Thank you very now, much. Now, I hand you back to Lorna Hackett for the last witness, please. Thank you, Mr. Mansfield. The last witness is Michael Bimler. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I have a, um, a short sort of overview note of the, um, of the evidence that you're going to be providing to the panel today. But could we start first with your occupation? Yes, I'm a barrister at Number 5 Chambers, and I specialise in public law and human rights law. Thank you. Um, can we start with the, the international law principle, which is that states are to do no harm or try to do no harm? Um, you, you talk about this in, in, your, uh, in your note of evidence. And it's, I, I'd like, could you explain sort of 
um, how that relates to COVID-19 uh, and what states are required to do under the no harm principle. Yes, absolutely. So the no harm principle is a principle in international law that says that states have a duty to take all appropriate measures to prevent and reduce what is called significant transboundary harm. So harm that crosses borders from one country into another. Whether that originates from their territory or whether it's only crossed the territory from that state. And importantly, that duty also includes an obligation to cooperate in good faith with other states to together prevent such transboundary harm and minimize its effects. And that does not only apply to harm that was somehow caused by a state, it absolutely applies to natural disasters uh, or accidents. Uh, the states have to take appropriate steps to prevent harms. And when you look at that, you look at the conduct of the state as a whole. So you look at what it's done in terms of legislative activities, regulatory measures, but you also look at the operational implementation. And the greater the risk of the harm at hand is, uh, the more efforts are required from the state. Now, what, what does that mean for COVID-19? Uh, of course, uh, all the states, whether COVID-19 or a variant originated on their territory or not, are and were subject to this duty. So they have a duty and have a duty to stop the further spread of the pandemic, or at least to take such steps as they can to stop the further spread and to prevent or reduce further outbreaks. And this is of course particularly relevant to the UK as it is a state where at least one variant now known as Alpha, formerly B117, uh, has newly emerged. So questions are raised, what were its duties to prevent that variant spreading to other countries? Uh, but also this international law duty to cooperate is uh, in my opinion, really interesting when you look at some of the topics raised by other uh, experts or other witnesses today namely the sharing of vaccines and the sharing of drugs, the sharing of PPE, the sharing of medical equipment and ventilators. Uh, quite often this is now presented as a sort of charitable gesture by countries that they're now sharing vaccines and giving access to vaccines. But the question is, do they under international law actually have a duty to do so? And if they don't, uh, are they failing in that duty? So the, uh, the world, as we know, the World Health Organization um, declared um, the COVID-19 outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern uh, back in January. Um, and uh, you, you talk in your note about the international health regulations. Um, can you just, uh, there are sort of questions arising, aren't there, as to whether the UK's handling of COVID uh, before and after that declaration happened um, was uh, appropriate. Can you just explain uh, what the concerns might be in that regard? Yes, absolutely. So the, the international health regulations date from 2005. They're, they're a binding instrument as a matter of international law. They were adopted by the World Health Assembly, which is sort of the WHO's parliament, uh, by more than 190 countries, including the UK. Uh, and they impose a number of mandatory obligations on states. Uh, and to pick out two in particular, Firstly, states are under a duty to develop, strengthen, and maintain the capacity to respond promptly and effectively to public health risks, and in particular to these public health emergencies of international concern. And as you pointed out, that is a, a status or a label which the WHO Director General gives to public health risks uh, on advice from a expert committee. And the second point is that states are also under a duty to base the implementation of any public health measures which they take on scientific principles and on the available scientific evidence. Uh, and they should look to the guidance and advice provided by the WHO. And now there are a number of questions um, regarding whether the UK's handling of COVID-19 was actually compliant with the international health regulations. Uh, you can look at the UK's preparedness in terms of adequate pandemic planning before, were they adequately planning for such a respiratory virus pandemic? Uh, you can look at its capacity to respond to the outbreak from the start and as it developed. So that's availability of PPE, ventilators, hospital beds, medical staff, et cetera. Uh, but then you have to look at the early response and, and in particular prior to the first lockdown measures in late March, 2020, did they do enough to uh, effectively and promptly respond to the public health risk? Uh, and then you can look at the measures taken actually during the first wave. So just to give a few keywords, 
discharge of patients into care homes without testing, uh, protection of patients from nosocomial infections in hospital settings and care homes, all these measures. Um, and then you can look again, what happened in autumn 2020, how they reacted to the, the second wave, what, what is now known as the, the alpha variant, whether that was done promptly and effectively. Uh, and again, I'm afraid right now, when you're looking at the spread of the Delta variant, uh, are they responding in a prompt and effective manner? Uh, and do they have, uh, did they develop and maintain the capacity to do so? And indeed, did they, always uh, did they always base their measures on scientific principles or not? So domestically, we have, of course, the um, European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, particularly, I know in your note, you talk about Article 2, the right to life. Article 3, the right not to be subjected to inhumane treatment, and Article 8, the right to respect for private and family life. Um, can you just tell the panel a little bit about how those articles apply to the government response to COVID-19 and whether the acts and omissions of the government could, uh, whether those articles could be engaged in respect of their acts or omissions? Yes, so what is quite important to know about these articles is that they also include what are known as positive duties. That means Article 2, the right to life, doesn't only protect you from being unlawfully killed by the state, or Article 3 doesn't only protect you from being tortured by the state, but it also means that under these articles and under the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and other courts, the government has a duty to take proactive steps to reduce the risk of individuals suffering this fate, i.e. suffering death or suffering a very severe injury. Where the government knows or ought to know, and that's quite important, I think, where it knows or ought to know of a real risk. And that's a so-called systemic duty. It's a, it's a duty owed really to the public at large, but also and in particular, it's owed to uh, exposed people. So for example, frontline workers in the NHS, but also people who are particularly vulnerable to a certain risk. So when you talk about COVID, that's people who are vulnerable because of their age, because of their pre-existing medical conditions, because of their ethnicity indeed, as we've heard. And the uh, states like the UK, public authorities have to take practice steps such as they have to make sure they're actually investigating and monitoring the risks properly. And they have to have regard to all the relevant information. They have to inform the public properly about the risks. And uh, most importantly, perhaps, they have to put in place appropriate and effective safeguards to protect the public. And it is quite clear from the case law that uh, acts and emissions in areas such as healthcare policy, healthcare provision, healthcare regulation uh, are covered by this Article 2, the right to life. Um, I'm, we're sort of running out of time, so I'm going to just chop and change a little bit here. Um, just very briefly, uh, the Article Article 2 uh, investigative duty of the state, um, if, could you just cover a little bit on that? And then we're just going to move on to the Secretary of State's public health duty. Absolutely. So that, that's a duty uh, to investigate uh, where there is an arguable case that the state's breach of those duties, which I've mentioned before, those proactive duties, uh, that the state's breach of those duties has caused someone's death. So the state needs to investigate, it's not voluntary. Uh, that said, it, it, it is in principle for the state to decide what kind of investigation they do. Uh, and, and typically in the UK, uh, these are coroner's inquests. Uh, but the investigation has to be independent, effective, and it has to be reasonably prompt, and there has to be a sufficient element of public scrutiny. Uh, and arguably, when you have systemic issues involved, uh, or you have national level policy decisions involved, uh, a coroner's inquest into an individual case uh, might not actually suffice to discharge that investigative duty. You might be required by law to have a public inquiry and indeed to have one promptly. Um, and I've got a question from a member of the public now. This is from Alex Scott Samuel of Liverpool. It's clear from the inquiry and from the evidence of Dominic Cummings and others that deliberately chosen government policies have caused vast numbers of avoidable deaths. Should Johnson, Hancock, Stevens and possibly others be charged with corporate manslaughter? Uh, well, the first and, and perhaps a bit simplistic answer to that is that individuals cannot be charged with corporate manslaughter. You can only bring those uh, charges against an organization, uh, but that organization could be 
a public body such as the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, it could also be a local authority or an <coughs> NHS trust. They can all, in principle, commit corporate manslaughter. Uh, what, what does corporate manslaughter actually mean? This is an offence where you have a death resulting from an organization's gross breach of a relevant duty of care. Uh, and it, it is quite complex to prove. You need to prove a, a number of different things. You, you need to show that there were failings of senior management, which have played a substantial part uh, in the gross breach. Uh, and you have to show that the organization failed to comply with health and safety legislation. It's quite a serious failure. Um, that a risk of death was then posed, and that you have some evidence of attitudes and policies and practices in the organization that were likely to encourage such a failure. Uh, so, so there are quite a few elements which you need to bring together for a successful prosecution. And the other thing to bear in mind is that there is a specific exemption in the act, uh, which has set up the corporate manslaughter offense, that uh, where decisions of a public authority in relations to issues of public policy, such as how financial resources are allocated or how competing public interests uh, should be weighed, uh, that cannot form the basis of a corporate manslaughter prosecution. Uh, now, all this said, I'm not aware of any current criminal investigations into corporate manslaughter. There, there may be some, but they wouldn't be in the public domain. Uh, but it is interesting that a, a specialist senior barrister, Queen's Counsel, who does a lot of serious criminal work, uh, has recently given his opinion in a newspaper column in The Guardian, I believe. Uh, and this was following uh, the revelations about Department of Health and Social Care and, and what actions they took about discharging COVID patients back into uh, care homes without testing. Uh, and he said on the basis of the evidence he's seen for that, or if there is enough evidence, uh, that could raise some serious questions about whether there is liability for that department for corporate manslaughter. But that of course would have to be properly investigated in, and tested in the court. I'm not making any comment on that. Understood. Thank you. Um, and um, pleasingly uh, and apparently fully aware of the fact that this is our last um, session of the People's Cable Inquiry, Dominic Cummings decided today to uh, release some information on his blog, um, which apparently relates to an exchange between him and the Prime Minister last March uh, relating to the lack of testing um, in comparison with the United States and the impact that that would have on NHS staff. The response, which has been attributed to uh, Boris Johnson, the allegation is that he text back totally fucking hopeless. Now, um, just in relation to the, the regulation of health and safety at work, um, and also, of course, the Secretary of State's general public duty um, under the NHS Act 2006, what should have happened with testing and tracing? How should people have been protected at work in the NHS? Well, what exactly should have happened is probably a question for a public health expert. What I can say from the, from the legal angle is that as you mentioned, there is this duty in the NHS Act. It's a duty on the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. And it's a duty to take appropriate steps to protect the public in England, because other devolved administrations look after other countries, but to protect the public in England from disease or other dangers to public health. Now, that's quite a broadly phrased duty. And in general, the courts would give the Secretary of State quite a bit of leeway as to how to discharge that duty. Uh, but still, he needs to uh, exercise his duty rationally, and he needs to exercise it in accordance with its purpose, which is to keep the public health and to promote public health in England. So that could be, in principle, though it may be very difficult, that could be tested in court, whether he has uh, fulfilled that duty. Um, as to health and safety at work, um, that, that's another huge area. But what there is, is there is an, there's an overarching duty, uh, in particular in, on employers, to ensure the health and, and safety and the welfare at work uh, of their employees, um, but not only their employees, but also others uh, who could be affected by their undertakings. So that could be subcontractors, visitors, customers, other members of the public. Uh, and in essence, there are quite a few sort of detailed duties, but in essence, it's about providing a, a system of work, a workplace, uh, that is safe, uh, that does not pose a risk to health as far as that's reasonably practicable and to give necessary training and, and equipment. And then you have specific regulations on uh, PPE, for example. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those in detail, but there is specific regulations about supplying PPE, supplying appropriate PPE, uh, supplying uh, PPE correctly that, that fits the wearers, et cetera. So there are quite a few sort of detailed regulations. And if you breach those, uh, you can actually be committing a criminal offense. 
Thank you. Um, I don't know if we've got any more time for any questions from me, but I think that the panel may have some questions for you. Um, um, yes, I'm just going to, um, because of the logistics here, before I ask them, make sure we have a, 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 um, a sort of margin of latitude here. Um, I'll ask the questions if, if, if in fact they're too complicated, do say. So. One general, one specific. First question, which will be burning through people's lips as you speak, and may I say a very clear exposition you have given. In relation to the international obligations, if it is shown that the government or ministers have violated international obligations, of which you spelt out a number, first of all, who can take them to task and where do they do it? How do they do it? That's the general one, specific. Our first witness tonight, I don't, I think you were here, to, to, to hear her speak that, uh, about, uh, she called it negligent manslaughter. She put it in the context of herd immunity. Now, if a government decides, oh, we're not gonna worry about you know, protecting people, we say the best way forward is just to allow 60% uh, of the population to become infected or more, and a certain number, proportion, quite a high proportion, will probably die, but that's the way life is. Does, does that qualify to the kind of manslaughter that she introduced at the start of her, her evidence? So firstly, uh, do you understand both questions? And if you do, have you got, have you got a minute to spare answering them? Absolutely, or, or an hour indeed. Um, well, starting with the first question on who could bring a claim and how you would do it, I think it's, it's important to differentiate between um, claims which would be made that the UK government has violated European human rights law and claims um, that it's violated international law. Uh, when you look at human rights law, that, that's a challenge. So these Article 2 and 3 duties, right to life, etc., which you spoke about, these are claims which could be brought by victims in the domestic courts here in the UK. Uh, and when I say victims, I mean these are people uh, who've either suffered from COVID themselves and, and survived perhaps after a severe clinical course, uh, but also uh, the, the close relatives uh, of someone who's died from COVID. Uh, if they believe they have a case that the government has breached its obligations uh, to right to life, et cetera, they could in principle bring a case. Uh, on the international level, uh, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, international law that is not specifically incorporated by the UK Parliament into domestic law uh, cannot usually be relied on just like that if you bring a case in the UK courts. You can use it uh, to support uh, your interpretation or what you say should be the court's interpretation of domestic law, uh, but you can't base your claim purely on the international law. Uh, what could happen in theory is that other states bring claims against uh, the UK uh, in various fora, or what could happen is that other states take countermeasures against the state like the UK if they feel the UK uh, has violated its legal obligations uh, in a certain way. Uh, but then, then that, of course, would be a, a highly political decision for that state to bring a claim against the UK. But as far as the international law duties are concerned, uh, that can, in a sense, only really be brought in, uh, in a subsidiary manner in a domestic claim, in my opinion, if you were to go to a domestic court. Um, now, on, uh, on the issue of manslaughter, um, I, I'm going to be a bit careful what I say there because I'm not a, a criminal lawyer, um, and I think there are probably others who could answer that better than me. Uh, but I, I would say that if, if those decisions were made, and, and you'd have to sp look specifically at who has made what decisions, because as soon as you go into questions of criminal law, you're either trying to prosecute one individual uh, who's made certain decisions, or you're trying to prosecute one specific entity. That entity cannot be the UK government as a whole. And you ha you'd have to see whether uh, those actions which they've taken actually stand up to the definition of corporate manslaughter, which I've given, or if it was an individual, perhaps gross negligence manslaughter. Um, and, and if not, if there is any other charges that you could potentially bring, uh, but, but that's probably as far as I should go. <laughs> yes, don't worry. Um, <laughs> you won't be prosecuted. Um, any other questions? Yes, Professor. 
Very quickly, thank you, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for that. Is, can you give us any instance of a, of, a, of a previous occurrence of a successful case being brought um, for corporate manslaughter against a government department? Uh, I am personally not aware of any, uh, but given that corporate manslaughter is not as such my area of expertise, uh, I would take that statement from me with a pinch of salt. Uh, perhaps the chair knows of an occurrence. I'm not aware of any. Thank you. Yeah, there, there is one, but I'm not going to give it now. Any other questions before we say thank you and good night? I don't think so. May I thank you very much, Michael, for spending time, particularly, and I know you've been under time pressure yourself. Thank you. And I hand back now to Tony for the finale. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you to the panel. Um, sincere thanks to all the excellent witnesses tonight. So thank you to Deepti, to Kevin, to Steve, to Jean, and finally to Michael, Michael Bimler. And thank you also to, to Matt um, Weston in absentia for, for his statement. Um, all of you are really, really massively busy. And I know we've added to your stress usually, but it was worth it. From our point of view, it was worth it. Thank you very much indeed. Now, this is our last session, so there's a, a, a little bit of, of sadness. Um, it's fantastic that hundreds of people have stayed with us for this long session tonight. And thank you very much for doing that. And thank you for, for all of those that have joined us over the nine sessions. We've had hundreds of people listening and thousands of people watching it elsewhere. We are really proud of what the inquiry has achieved. It, it set out to look for urgent lessons to be learned now from this coronavirus pandemic and to recommend action that would save lives. And in that regard, we completely support Jean. We support the Bree Families for Justice, their demand for a public inquiry now, not in March, especially not in March when the findings won't be for many years. It, it, it's really quite hard not to express or to feel outright anger at the evidence that we've heard over the last few months. We've had 41 witnesses over our nine uh, sessions and tonight is our last. Um, but this isn't the last you'll hear from us. For now, a, a huge thank you indeed to Michael Mansfield, to Nina, to Tallulah and Jackie, our, uh, our chair and panel, and to Lorna, our, our brilliant council, who's been fantastic for us. Thank you very much. And a personal thank you to our Keep Our Anxious public team, led by Tom and others behind the scenes, and to the comp executive members that have made this inquiry possible. Can you please put in your diary the, the note that I've put in the chat room a few times? We are going to have a press conference on Wednesday the 7th of July at 1 p.m. You've got the link in the chat room. It's going to be open to the public, although the questions we hope will be from the press. And we will be showing there, the panel will be, I should say, showing uh, what we've learned from this inquiry, the manifestly obvious findings, the urgent recommendations that need urgent action. And we hope that that will be out there then and the press will take this up. And we expect that our final report from this panel will be available in published form on, online and in print sometime towards the end of September or October when we will be presenting that to the government and to the public. So once again, a really warm thank you to the public who've been following us over the last four months, to the panel, and as I said, to over 40 witnesses and even more who've given video testimony that wasn't able to be taken on the, the various nights. Good night, everybody, and thank you for your stamina tonight. Uh, see you all soon. <laughs>